Great. Um, so, uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to all the um, that's signing in from around the world to this um, joint. This is the part one of uh, two webinars uh, looking at soft tissue reconstruction in the upper limb. And we will be concentrating on non-microvascular uh, reconstruction today. And we have a very exciting panel uh, with a lot of interesting, we have six interesting talks today, followed by some uh, clinical cases for our expert panel to discuss. And um, before we start, I um, have the honor of introducing a couple of people. Uh, firstly, I'd like to introduce Ms. Ruth Waters, the current uh, BAPRAS president. Ms. Waters is a consultant plastic surgeon at the University of Birmingham NHS Trust. Uh, specialising in uh, microvascular breast reconstruction and reconstruction of the lower limb. Uh, welcome, Ruth. Uh, if you'd like to say a few words, that'd be great. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Neil, for that introduction. It's really a, a very great pleasure to be here today. Um, as we all know, Be First was developed to reach out across the world to other countries and to share our knowledge and skills in plastic surgery. So in BATPRAS, uh, which for those uh, out there who, who don't know, BATPRAS is the British Association of Plastic Reconstructive and Aesthetic Surgery. Um, and in BATPRAS, we've always been enormously proud to be associated with uh, Be First and the work they do and to support it in any and every way that we can. So, of course, over the last 18 months or so, the work of uh, Be First has been um, on hold to some extent, um, in particular, the face-to-face -face work that um, is so wonderful with our surgeons going out there and um, other surgeons coming here on fellowships. Um, so that, that's really had to pause to a large extent. Um, but that's why really we're so fortunate that we have this modern technology um, that we can still interact and learn together and come together as we are today on this webinar. So I'm very grateful to WeLamp for kindly inviting me. Um, although, as you say, I, my main interests at the moment are uh, microsurgery in terms of breast reconstruction, um, it may all interest you to know that my, my first love actually as is, is a plastic surgeon was hand surgery. And my, the fellowship I did as I finished my training was in hand surgery at the Paul Vittar Centre in Derby. So I did spend um, a good few years with that being one of my main specialist interests. And so I'm intrigued to hear uh, where you know, the state of play is today. I'm really looking forward to hearing these world experts uh, who have come together to enlighten and inspire us. And so um, I can't wait to hear it all. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Ruth, um, and welcome. Uh, I'd like to introduce um, uh, one of my uh, international colleagues, Dr. Atakilte Baraki, who is a consultant in general plastic and reconstructive surgery at the Alert Centre in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. I've been fortunate enough to work with Be First, uh, that's the British Foundation um, of International Reconstructive Surgical Training, and travelled to Ethiopia on a couple of occasions to um, collaborate there with the surgeons and run a um, hand workshop. And I'm thankful that Dr. Atakilte and Dr. Abraham can join us here today for the webinar. Uh, Dr. Atakilte, if you'd like to say a few words, that would be great. Thank you. So much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Atkil from uh, from Ethiopia. I'm very glad that I'm invited to this uh, webinar, and it's going to be my first time to be with you this afternoon. Uh, I remember uh, the couple of uh, collaborative moments that we have had some years back with you. It was very fruitful for our residents and also for us to exchange uh, the skill and knowledge. Because of the COVID, uh, we were not able to continue for the last two years. I hope we'll come back and uh, do it again when we are released from this uh, difficult disease, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this webinar would really be very much helpful for our residents and uh, fellows. Also, we consultants will, will have also moments to exchange uh, skills and knowledge. 
thank you very, thank you very much again. Hopefully, uh, I will be more involved with you in the coming uh, webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you, Atikalti. Um, so uh, before we move on and start with our talks, uh, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, the, this webinar will be recorded this afternoon and will be available next week, both on YouTube and the BSSH website. Um, there will be attendance certificates sent out to all the delegates um, and there will be up to two CME points available. Um, can I ask that if you have any questions during the talks to please uh, submit them via the Q&A function at the bottom bar on your screen and not via the chat function. And um, just to remind all the panelists and speakers to please mute yourself when you're not talking. And um, uh, again, we will uh, advertise the part two part of the uh, webinar at the end, and there will be a link sent to all delegates after the webinar with the opportunity to sign up for that one in a month's time. So if I can move on now to introduce our first speaker. Fortune Ewagu, who is a consultant plastic surgeon working at the St Andrews Centre for Plastic Surgery in Chelmsford. Um, he has a special interest in hand reconstruction as well as general microsurgical reconstruction. Uh, welcome, Fortune. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Fortune Iwagu and uh, I thank you Neil and we for giving me the privilege to talk about the applied anatomy, the assessment and principles that govern soft tissue cover in this uh, particular webinar. If we're thinking about non-microsurgical uh, non uh, treatments. So I'm going to focus and go straight into uh, the into the applied vascular anatomy that I mentioned Talk, uh, talk a bit about the tendons and the nerves and bones, because obviously these structures are the skin cover is not damaged in exclusion. There are other things also damage with it. If we go straight uh, to uh, to the hand itself, there are two surfaces to the hand. The dorsum of the hand has the the non glabrous tissue, non glabrous skin, which you have everywhere. You can see that it is thin and pliable. It's very available. There's a redundancy of the skin over the joints. So this give, this longitudinal give is very important when you raise flaps and this helps with mobility. So it accommodates mobility. While on the palmar surface of the hand, the skin is quite anterior in its own line of so, uh, subcutaneous um, fibrous tissue. The glabrous skin, which you have on the palm of the hand is thick, is non-hairy, limited availability, you only see it in the palms and the soles of the feet. It's designed for stability and load bearing. There are also specialized damp endings on the ditch, on the, on the palms of the hand, which help us feel very fine discriminative uh, touch, vibration, and the shape and texture of objects. If we move straight into the vascular anatomy, we know from our medical school that the main blood supply to the hand is provided by the ulnar and the radial artery. The ulnar is the main, um, the, main, the main contributor to the superficial palmar arch. And it normally is completed by the radial artery. The radial artery at the level of the cellular process deviates dorsally deep to the anatomical snuff box to form the uh, deep palmar arch. It also gives us the superficial palmar branch, which divides into a superficial and a deep branch. The deep branch normally completes this. Sometimes the superficial palmar arch is completed by the median artery over the median nerve. So now the superficial palmar arch then gives common digital arteries, a letter palmar digital arteries to the ulnar three and a half fingers, while the radial artery gives it to the thumb and the radial side of the index finger. Now, on this palmar surface on the palm, there are so many perforators that come. Like, for example, if you do work on the hand uh, re regularly with Jupiterans, uh, like people locally there, you find a lot of perforators that come out here, which you need to preserve. Otherwise, there'll be necrosis of tissues here. Even with this, you can raise flap. These intermedical perforators, 
you have it here with the digital address to the, to the uh, little finger. And there's a plethora of them here between the digital address of the index, the firm, and the superficial PAMA edge. And based on these, multiple flaps that can be raised to cover uh, defects in the PAM. The superficial PAMA edge is complete in less than half of the population. The importance of this <clears throat> that is incomplete in greater half than half. So that if somebody raises the main vessels to do a flap and is an incomplete superficial PAMA edge, there may be faster compromise in the digits. Now, as I said, because of this and profuse anastomosis or profuse blood supply to the palm of the hand, one can base a flap based on the superficial palm branch of radial artery. And this is the reach. You can cover the whole surface of the thumb. Sorry about that. Surface of the thumb, the index finger, different reach. You can go, as is done here, cover the thumb. Also, you can use it for the index finger here. You can also use the same superficial palm branch to cover a defect on the side of the thumb. You take it from here and put it there. Now, if we move from the thumb, this is just every, remember, you're going to have a talk on different forms of reconstruction. However, I'm just, as I'm explaining vascularis anatomy, I'm just giving some examples uh, to make it uh, relevant. Now, if you go to the digits, this is Cotsy of Missing Range and a retired consultant plastic surgeon. Now, this illustration here, you can find that the two, there are two digital arteries to every finger. There's a profuse anastomosis between the two sides. There's a palmar arch at the level of the neck of the proximal of, of the phalanges. And also there's a barization over the distal phalanx. But very importantly, there are branches both to the palmar surface or the volar surface of the finger and also to the dorsum of the finger, especially the one over the uh, mid-level of the proximal phalanx. It's fairly constant. You see all these branches. So based on this, one can raise a piece of skin based on this. And if there's a defect in the tip of the thumb, turn it over as demonstrated here to cover uh, an amputation of the, of the tip. Now, because of this branching, both to the dorsum and the volar surface, that is the basis for more these numerous or this plethora of flaps that you have to cover skin defects like on the fingers. For example, this is a reverse cross finger. So there are two flaps being raised here. There are dorsal branches going into this, this, this aspect of the uh, cross finger. And also there are the professional aspect as well. There are dorsal branches going into it. The same thing with the popular V2Y flaps, which more as the alphabetoplasties that cut like Vs and that close like Ys. So they're called the alphabetoplasties. The, 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 the branching, the blood supply to the palmar surface is the real basis for having all these uh, uh, multiple flaps. You're going to talk about how to do the flaps later on in the lectures, but this is just to give you an example, another purpose of my talk. Now, if you get to the dorsum of the hand, there's a, proof, there's a robust dorsal metacarpal artery system. As you move from the radial to the ulnar aspect, the caliber of the vessels reduces, and even an incidence in congenital absence increases that some people don't have it in the fourth word space. The most constant is the second, and then followed by the first one. The dorsal carpal arch usually gives these metacarpal uh, arteries, and the first one usually arises from the radial artery. Now, this is from Palmer and Davison's paper of 1990, when they described the distally dorsal base flap, which now we've known is from this dorsal cutaneous branch from the dorsal metacarpal artery in the second web space. Now, you can see there's a profuse anastomosis between the dorsal and the palmar metacarpal and the palmar digital arteries up to the level of the proximal phalanx, which means that in addition to this flap, the other flaps have been raised as well. Somebody can go deep to the metacarpal artery and then extend the pivot to the proximal phalanx that will give you a longer reach to skin on the dorsal of the hand. So this was trying to demonstrate here on the hand of uh, Mr. Musa, who is a very esteemed fellow. Now, at this line here, this is the metacarpal, metacarpal phalangeal joint axis. One centimeter to each, you can use a dot line. Here the pulsation of dorsal cutaneous, uh, 
cutaneous branch of the medical artery, and you can risk in like this and take it to cover defects in the palm, also into the finger. And based on these multiple perforators, one can actually raise most of the dosing of the hand and cover defects. Move it as one. Let's move that's been done here. Obviously, one is also using the laxity that we have on the dosing of the hand to cover it as one go. The thumb particularly has a different dorsal blood supply when it's com when, when it compared to the other fingers. The radial artery, the terminal branch of radial artery, which you can feel where the sort of above where the second and the first and the couple meet each other. You can feel the pulsation in your own uh, hand if you abduct your first web space. So it gives up the dorsal metacarpal artery and also gives dorsal branches to the thumb, the ulna and the radial. So based on this, somebody can take this piece of skin based on this dorsal metacarpal artery and cover defects on both surfaces of the thumb as has been done here. This is a defect covering it. And the defect is covered by a skin graft. And this is the flower. Now, likewise, skin raised from here based on the anastomosis at the neck of the phalanx between the two digital arteries. Somebody can also raise a piece of skin here on the reverse, on the, on the dorsal ulnar branch, what is called the reverse dorsal ulnar flap or the Brunelli flap. That's the only one stem giving to it. And cover defects at the tip of the thumb. And so you don't have to make an incision on the real aspect of the thumb. So it's taken from here as the ample there. Now, the significance of this dorsal blood supply to the thumb, if you're going to raise this flap, is that now, this is what is done again on the, on the hand of uh, our esteemed fellow. Now, what I'm trying to show here, look, give dorsal branches. This is the digital artery giving dorsal branches and also velar branches. So if you raise a flap along the whole length of the finger by incising dorsal to it, you may compromise the blood supply to the finger. So most flaps that are raised in the finger, you see, they taper away after some time, either to the distal interphalangeal joint as you have in the outer side flap, or to the, the tranquilo yellow flap. You this to the proximal interphalangeal joint, so you still preserve these dorsal branches going to preserve the skin of the dorsal. Why in the thumb, when you raise like the mobile flap, which you're going to hear about, you can incise on the mid axial and all the length of it, and the blood supply to the thumb will still be preserved. The venous drainage is both from uh, large dorsal veins and the thinner, um, uh, thinner veins on the palmar aspect. The, the veins do not accompany the digital arteries, and they run at a more superficial level in the palm. But obviously, on the dust, you can see from many, many people, the veins are quite prominent there. Now, on the palm, what is, what is important to notice, because the veins do not accompany the arteries, if you're raising flaps on the palm or on the, on the uh, fingers, please do not skeletonize the pedicle, because the fine adipofacial tissue that covers the pedicle actually have very small vessels, small veins that drain the flap. Otherwise, they may be venous compromised. So we have talked out quickly about uh, vascular anatomy, what I regard as important vascular anatomy for soft tissue cover. Now, the, it comes to principles. The principle always, you know, in reconstructive surgery place like for like. It was very popular by a guy called uh, Sahorin uh, Gillies. But for the, for the fan, I would say you have to debride it properly. In clear, make sure the infection is clear. There's a stable frame or skeleton during any reconstruction. And avoid options that allow for prolonged immobilization and donation tissue because they obliterate the gliding planes of the hand. Remember that the hand is an organ that moves, and one that functions useful work. And there are considerations how to make with regards to the wound. For example, one needs to know the site and location of the wound. The site matters because the, the requirements of one particular site are different from the other. The size of the wound, the depth of the wound, structures that are damaged. Obviously, we talked about size, the function of that part of the hand. If there's a need for secondary surgery, then you need to change the option because you may prefer like something like a flap instead of a skin gram because the flap, you have to lift it up. And obviously, other things go without the sensation, movement, and vascularity. And patient, other patient factors are important is that patient needs to be properly counseled. And after all that is, we need to know what comorbidities, what other things the patient is suffering from. What's the patient's occupation? What are the demands of that occupation? What's the age of the patient? Hand dominance. What are the expectations? Are they going to be compliant with the hand therapy if you have those facilities available? And then in every particular institution, 
every surgeon has to be sincere to themselves about the skills they possess or the ones they want to possess. Um, and the resources available to them, they have a backup. These are the things that help people decide on the best option for the person for the environment. But when it comes into assessment of the patient, remember that we are all clinicians, even though we are surgeons, we're still clinicians. So history and examination investigation still stand. So patients need to be managed along the lines of advanced trauma life support. The, it's important to get all the bio data, like the name, age, and document all that, the offending weapon, because we're different, like as a cyclist. And um, everything, these are important things to document in the history. And then, as we were taught in medical school, inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation still stand. For the hand, most of the time, we just look and feel, we inspect and we palpate. However, if you have comorbidities, you may want to because and also you may want to sculpt it. And uh, obviously these are the structures from superficial to deep we're looking at when we're examining. On the skin, we want to know the site of the defect, the site of it, the depth, and the structures that are damaged or evidently damaged, as we mentioned. And then we want to know other structures, obviously the tendons and bones. You may, the patient, you, the surgeon or you as a surgeon may be asked to see a patient when uh, you won't be able to get much information. There are certain normal things we expect of the hand you can use that will give you an indication whether something is wrong with the deeper structures. For example, we know that the normal cascade is that there's an increasing flexion from the radial to the ulna. And when one wants to make a fist, the tips of the fingers point to the scaphoid tubercle. One can squeeze the hand as well, this squeeze the hand because it's squeeze test, and they flex, the tendons will flex. Also, did you know this is test? When the wrist is flexed, the fingers extend. When it is um, extended, the fingers flex. So something like uh, some of this kind of injury, you can see that the, the uh, little finger is flexed here. The thumb is in a good position, but the other fingers are really flail. So really, it's quite obvious that there's something wrong there. And also you may go for more in-depth investigation and more in-depth examinations to find out that the other structures are damaged. It goes without saying that vascularity, that the color is important, capillary refill, and the tugger, because the tugger is important because when there's not enough blood supply going to any part, it begins, it begins, it begins to empty. It, be, it feels a bit empty. And the sensation is one not very well uh, talked about, the sensation. Sensation is a very good sign of vascularity if you're in doubt. Sensitive areas of the body have blood supply. That doesn't mean that if it's insensitive, it doesn't have blood supply. But if you're in doubt, if it is sensitive, you can rest assured that blood is going in there. And obviously, there may be some, uh, some tests, you may do like the Alan's test, where you get the patient to squeeze out the blood supply and then sequentially, you occlude and sequentially release the on and radial arteries to see vascularity. Sensation, we shouldn't forget that. A quick way to test is always to know the autonomous zones of the nerves. For the radial nerve, is the decimal of the first wave space. The ulnar nerve is the pulp of the little finger. And for the uh, median nerve, is the pulp of the uh, index finger. Always compare the two sides after touching the patient. And then when we've done this, there may be a need for investigations. Actually, it's the most common thing that we do. But occasionally, there may be some specialized investigations that we may do. Then I think that documentation is important. Record keeping is essential. It's your duty of candor as a surgeon. You may want to refer to it. You may use it to instruct people. Also, you may use it to be instructed yourself. For example, you have a case you want to get some answers from another unit. You should be able to talk to them, talk to them in the same language. We, I didn't talk about uh, the zones of extensor tender and flexor tender because we should all know that. Because you record things according to establish uh, international standards about recording um, damage to different structures. You may use it for publication in medical legally, it may be important as well. Now, based on your knowledge of skin cover options, you begin to plan your treatment. Now, reconstruction before was taught in terms of a ladder, where you start from the simplest option to the most complex option. We think of it now as a toolbox and armory. You choose what is best for the patient, for your environment, for you as a surgeon when you consider all the things we've talked about. The options left for a non-microsurgery option apart from dressing is a skin graft or a flag. The flag could be local, could be regional, or could be a distant flag. Now, 
skin graft obviously we do that if an adequate vascularized bed. Flaps, we use flaps when the skin grafts are in have an, uh, there's an inadequate bed for the skin graft to take. We will plan for that surgery. Only the particular, particular areas of the of the hand where the mobility and resilience is designed, like in the fingertip. I know these things are basic. I know there are people who are very junior. For the senior people, it's very basic, but I know that we have a, a range of people listening to this. As I round up, we shouldn't forget the aesthetic aspects of reconstruction. Days are gone when hand reconstruction is just a matter of getting one particular function if following an injury. We should know that a hand that looks like a hand is one that patients will use. If it doesn't look like a hand, they will hide it. The are days that if you, you don't use it, you lose it. It really works because if they don't use it, the hand becomes less functional and the brain can mentally auto amputate it where people say, can you remove it? There are cosmetic units being described, as, but uh, briefly, just say that between the creases is one cosmetic unit. In other words, reconstructing the whole crease as one looks better than just a little part of it. Reconstruction that crosses creases that is not complete. When light shines on the hand, because of the undulating surfaces of the hand, does not look as appealing. For example, the dorsum of the hand is best reconstructed as one. In the palm, say there are five subunits. Um, <clears throat> Even as we talk about the status, this is just an example. This is just color, not that I mean aesthetic unit. This gentleman had a groin flap to salvage a referred replant. Now, because he has pigmented skin, he kept getting asked what happened to his finger because of the difference between the palmar skin color and that of the tip of the finger. So the treatment had to be to remove this non glabrous skin and replace it with a thick, um, split glabrous um, graft from uh, the hypothenemic eminence, and he was very satisfied. We shouldn't forget the donor side. As surgeons will want to do surgery, and in the acute stage, the patient is only interested in oh, repair, 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 that's what they want to. But in the long term, when the acute stage has waned, they begin to look at the donor side problems and actually your reconstruction. So donor side mobility sometimes is not very well talked about. It becomes an issue long term. So it's important as you choose a reconstruction option, make sure you cite your donor side properly. Proper counseling is, prefer is preferred, especially if, um, preferably with pictures. We also know that the dorsum of the hand, that's the reason I showed it, the dorsum of the hand and excessive surface of the forearm, which you use commonly, is actually an exposed part of the upper limb. No person goes around showing their palm. So treatment of genocide is quite important. In summary, we should be aware that it's a reconstructive toolbox that we need where I believe that when the pros and cons are properly considered and the patient is appropriately counseled, that a reasonable plan is made as feasible for the environment and for the surgeon, and someone has a second plan, the results are rewarded both for the reconstructive hand surgeon and for the patient. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Fortune. Um, thank you for that very uh, illuminating talk. And um, I, I need to apologize. I uh, failed to get put up your poll question beforehand. So we're just going to put up a poll question now for the delegates that are signed on. And um, we can talk through that if you would like to, if you can see the poll now um, from Fortune and just click on a answer. So there's a 40 year old man with a circular saw injury to the volar aspect of the thumb. That's divided the palmar digital vessels and nerves with significant loss of bowler skin presented with a well, well vascularized thumb. Why is this? And the options are, this is because the blood supply from the dorsal branches of the palmar digital arteries to the thumb, dorsal branches of the radial artery to the dorsum of the thumb or the first dorsal metacarpal artery. And if you, um, if you can answer that and we'll put up the, uh, the results of that poll. And here we go. Interestingly, the, uh, so 14% thought it was the dorsal branches of the Parma digital arteries. 66% uh, uh, felt it was the dorsal branches of the radial artery to the dorsum of the thumb, and 20% felt that it was the first dorsal metacarpal artery. 
Okay. Any comments, Fortune? Of course, it's B, the second one. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank that's, you very much. That's what I was trying to show that actually that the thumb has its own dorsal digital vessels provided by the brachial artery. Sometimes it's actually by the fences of the carpal artery, but it's, the answer is not C, it's B. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to put up a second poll question before the talk on fingertip reconstruction, and that should appear shortly. The question is a two-year-old with a traumatic amputation of the middle fingertip. And I'm not sure if the photograph is available as well. Perhaps not. Um, but the options here are how would you uh, reconstruct this? Um, trimming of the bone and conservative dressings, trimming of the bone and a uh, skin graft, formal terminalization at the DIP joint, cross finger flap, thinner flap, or a pedicle groin or abdominal flap. And we'll put up the uh, results of that uh, very shortly. Okay, and interestingly, 45% have felt that uh, trimming of the bone with conservative dressings is the best way forward, uh, followed by 24% would do a thinner flap, and in third place, 14% would do a cross finger flap. Um, Great, I'm glad to see that only 4% um, they would formally terminalize at the DIP joint. That's great, thank you. I'll, talk, I'll move on now with um, presentation on fingertip reconstruction. to make sure that um, everyone can see that there. I don't think we can, Neil, just yet. I'll share again. Okay. So um, my name is Neil Cahoon. I'm a consultant uh, plastic surgeon working in Edinburgh. Um, and I would like to talk to you today specifically about non-microvascular uh, fingertip um, and digital reconstruction. The uh, learning uh, objectives are as stated and with we will be applying these uh, specific indications for fingertip reconstruction and um, uh, conservative versus uh, surgical uh, management. So I'll talk a wee bit about general principles. I see there's a lot of trainees signed up from all around the world, and I think it's important coming up to exams that you're able to organize and um, have a system of management for the way you discuss not only the wound or the defect, but also your reconstructive options. And we will delve into some specific examples of both the fingertip and then at the end of the rest of the digit. So um, what are the unique challenges with the hand? Well, traditionally, and as Fortune has mentioned, we do talk about our reconstructive toolbox or the reconstructive ladder. And we're always looking for a simple, safe means of skin resurfacing. But in the hand, it's not always about plugging a hole. And there are certain considerations that need to be um, made when we're uh, dealing with a certain site for reconstruction. So, um, for example, here, this is a full thickness skin graft used a superficial contractor and the whole aspect of symptoms hand. This is a safe, uh, robust um, skin graft that um, is better than a split thickness graft in that you retain adnexal structures and you reduce the risk of um, secondary contracture. But as you can see here, we run into the same problems we do with grafts in this area where we get web creep and some recurrent contracture. 
So uh, this may not be the best long-term solution for this patient. So when we're thinking about the ideal flap for the hand, we obviously want thin pliable flaps that are going to be, especially around the joints where you're going to be rehabbing a hand and we want flexibility around those joints. But when we think about the fingertips compared to the rest of the hand, sensation is of paramount importance and not so much tendon gliding like in the hand, wrist and forearm. So we're looking for sensate, glabrous, like for like skin. So concentrating on fingertip injuries, I like to start with this quite old CME article now from 2008. And the useful part of this article is where they have uh, separated the types of fingertip amputation into dorsal and volar oblique, as well as transverse. And this allows us to, um, to separate our uh, type of uh, amputation and, and basically uh, have an idea on the type of reconstruction we want to do. So looking at volar oblique uh, amputations, Certainly a superficial amputation like shown here can heal well with secondary intention. And um, I have a fairly low threshold as to most of the um, colleagues I work with for um, uh, allowing these fingertips to heal by secondary intention, even if a small amount of bone is exposed. This will certainly give you a more robust sensate fingertip, although it can take up to six weeks to heal. I would implore you not to skin wrap these fingertips because it reduces the sensation in the tip. And this is an example of a uh, traumatic amputation with some bone exposed and loss of distal nail bed. And on the right hand side, this is following a period of conservative management with dressings. In our unit, we see the IB3000, which is the dressings you'll, you'll know well for cannulas, sighting cannulas. It's an occlusive dressing that can be placed on and then a simple mallet splint placed on for comfort. We change the dressing once a week until the fingertip is healed. So uh, moving on, if we're looking at dorsal oblique defects on the left, this is where um, you have plenty of pulp tissue available and this enables you to utilize the V to Y advancement flap shown here or commonly known as the atazoi flap. This is a uh, volar V to Y advancement based on the pulp tissue with the apex of the V at the DIP joint. It's important to remember that the flap be released completely at the um, periosteum and the flexor sheath of the FDP. And then with distal tension on the flap, the, the uh, lateral aspects of the V are incised down to the perivascular uh, tissue. This can be then teased apart as the flap is pulled distally and you can get five to 10 millimeters of advancement. Minimal suture should be placed then to avoid any vascular compromise to the flap. Uh, the lateral V to Y advancements, eponymously known as cutlers uh, flaps, can be used for a more transverse um, than volar oblique defect and as shown here on the right. Um, I don't have clinical examples of this because this is not a flap I'm keen on. Um, I feel that they don't, uh, the flaps do not move as far as you would like them to, and they do leave a, a rather painful midline scar of the distal pulp. Um, the Thena flap is a very useful flap for a large volar oblique defect, as shown here on the right, and it can be raised as a single uh, flap uh, random pattern pedicle, or can be raised as an H style uh, pedicle for simultaneous uh, dorsal and volar reconstruction seen here in an infant's fingertip with exposure of the uh, distal phalanx. And this, um, as you can see here, is placed down into the palm for two to three weeks, and then we'll give a nice result with um, minimal loss of length. So uh, moving on, uh, to uh, volar oblique defects um, where a significant amount of bone is involved or exposed. Um, this really depends on the um, patient uh, choices uh, and this can be down to occupation, culture or certain hobbies where the patient wants to maintain as much length as possible. These are the homodigital uh, neurovascular island flaps, eponymously known by different names such as Seg Muller, Venkata Swami, or the uh, Evans Step Advancement. 
which requires a bit more forward planning and thinking, but um, can certainly avoid the risk of uh, linear skin contracture secondarily. If we are really stretching the bounds of non-microvascular reconstruction, we can utilize uh, a different type of homodigital uh, neurovascular island flap, a reverse uh, pedicled flap seen here, uh, utilizing the transverse commissural ligament, uh, transverse commissural artery, which passes just deep to the crural ligament here, proximal to the PIP joint. This means a pad, a pad of sensate skin can be raised from the bowler base of the finger and turned through 180 degrees to provide sensate cover to the pulp. If we're looking at a larger defect, then the workhorse flap, uh, I would say, is the cross finger flap, which um, seen here traditionally uh, raised from the dorsum of the middle finger and used to reconstruct either the uh, adjacent index or ring finger. Um, there are certainly uh, several um, modifications of this, such as the uh, reverse cross finger flap using an adipofascial flap. Um, and uh, another modification is the one stage cross finger flap seen here to reconstruct a dorsal defect at the P1 level. This is utilizing this uh, uh, perforated, perforators from the dorsal metacarpal artery in the web space. Uh, here's an example of a traditional cross finger flap from the dorsum of the middle finger to reconstruct an index. Um, it's important to raise the flap right back to the mid axial level, but uh, protecting the dorsal um, branches. And if possible, I like to leave a um, dorsal vein at the hinge side to aid the drainage. The other tip I would say is to not be tempted to do any secondary inset at the second stage of division. So this is after two to three weeks when you divide, do not um, insert either the recipient or the donor site and uh, simply wrap up both fingers and they will heal perfectly well by secondary intention. Um, if we're looking at larger defects on the dorsum of the finger, another uh, workhorse or go-to flap is the hatchet flap um, seen here. Um, you can see that it can be, it needs to be completely elevated off the underlying parotenum. Um, again, we are utilizing these uh, perforators from the dorsal metacarpal arteries in the web space, and this allows you to make quite a significant back cut and get um, uh, quite a lot of advancement down the finger. Seen here in this example, there's loss of dorsal cortex and loss of the central slip. So this was uh, reconstructed with the uh, stack procedure using the uh, ulnar slip of FDS. And then uh, closure with uh, closure of the common limb seen there over the dorsum of the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Um, as I work in Edinburgh, I would be remiss for not mentioning the Quaba flap. Uh, no, this was previously mentioned by Fortune in his talk. This is the dorsal metacarpal artery perforator flap seen here, which can be rotated through 180 degrees to reconstruct the dorsum of the finger. The lateral limits of the flap are as shown, the adjacent lateral borders of the metacarpal um, and the proximal limit at the distal edge of the retinaculum. And these flaps can be raised um, based on the second, third or fourth web space vessels. Um, but again, as Fortune has mentioned, uh, less um, uh, less uh, useful in the fourth web space and maybe a very small vessel at this stage. So uh, these uh, flaps, you can raise a small adip adiposal bridge to extend the reach of the flap and can also incise the dorsal aspect of the web space to aid with rotation. This is an example of an abrasion injury over the, um, uh, with loss of the central slip, uh, loss of bone and tissue here in the uh, P1 and P2 areas of the finger. And uh, this is the um, quabo flap uh, raised and rotated um, into position there with a slightly longer flap than uh, one would raise and uh, perhaps going proximally over the retinaculum, but still with a perfused tip. For um, multiple soft digit 
soft uh, tissue loss in the digits, the best uh, non-microsurgical options are the use of random pattern flaps in the hypogastric region of the abdomen. The hypogastric region allows you to keep the hand in a less, uh, in a non-dependent position to aid with swelling and um, help with rehabilitation. Seen here in this paper um, by uh, David Bell, um, the flaps can be raised and then uh, closed obliquely, um, which allows you to um, plan your reconstruction of both dorsal and volar aspects. You can use the uh, groin flap for a similar reconstruction of multiple digits by syndactylizing the digits, and then this requires a second and third stage to release these uh, fingers. So uh, in summary, and relating to our learning objectives, uh, we've uh, shown the indications for fingertip reconstruction and remembering uh, conservative management with secondary intention healing will give you robust sensate soft tissue, even if a small amount of bone is exposed. If you um, need to use a homodigital flap, um, remember sensate glabrous skin if possible. And remember, for multiple soft tissue uh, digit loss, uh, regional um, flaps in the abdomen and hypogastric region or the groin flap as well. Thanks, Neil. Uh, just a couple of questions uh, before we move on to the next uh, talk. Actually, if uh, more of the panel can uh, participate in this, that will be great. We don't have time to answer all the questions and I think some of the questions will be covered in the, in the later talks. So maybe a question for you, especially Neil. Uh, what factors do you consider uh, to let a fingertip injury heal by secondary intention versus the use of an etosoy flap, for example? You're muted. A lot of this comes down to uh, patient choice. A lot of um, patients are happy to uh, allow um, a, a fingertip injury to heal over a six week period um, and are happy to lose a bit of length to allow that to happen, which would uh, mean trimming the bone and allowing secondary intention healing. Other patients, for whatever reason, as I mentioned, occupational, cultural, Certain hobbies may uh, require that length and not want any shortening, and therefore we are looking at uh, local uh, flaps to maintain that. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I think I think Hank is answer, uh, helping to answer some of the questions. I think we should move on, uh, Neil, because of time. Um, right, we can we can show up the next poll. So yeah, the next poll here for yourself, we. This is, uh, the question is, what is the, your preference for a complete thumb pulp defect um, with exposed tendon? So what is your preference for reconstruction of a complete thumb pulp defect? So the options are Moberg flap, Fouché or kite flap, cross finger flap, reversed cross finger flap, or to amputate at the level of the IP joint. Those answers will be with us just shortly. Okay, so 54% um, of the delegates have gone with the Moberg flap for reconstruction of complete thumb pulp defect, 25% with the Fouché flap and 12% with the cross finger flap. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to introduce one of my close colleagues I work with in Edinburgh, Mr. Wee Lam. He is a consultant, uh, plastic and congenital hand surgeon. Um, his main interests, including congenital hand surgery, um, hand reconstruction and nerve reconstruction in the upper limb. And he is the immediate past chair of the Be First um, group. So welcome, we. Thank you. <clears throat> it's a video to play, Amy. Thanks. Thanks.
Good afternoon. This talk is about soft tissue cover for thumb defects. Just a reminder of the learning objectives. At the end of this uh, lesson, the participant should be able to apply the indications for thumb reconstruction and decide on conservative versus surgical uh, methods. So if you look at the thumb defect like this, the key questions uh, that should come into your mind and my mind uh, are, what are your considerations for this patient? It's important to look at the patient as a whole and not just the thumb defect. What are your considerations for this thumb defect itself? And then after that, what reconstructive options will you choose and why? So the thumb is an important part of the hand. This is from the American Hand Society. Uh, it gives a very useful indication for the impact of um, loss to the hand uh, when a digit is missing or amputated. So for example, if you look at the thumb itself, the thumb uh, constitutes about 40% of overall hand function. So if you lose the thumb at the IP joint, they calculated this to be about 20% uh, functional loss because this is 50% of 40%. So it's 50 times 40, which gives you 20%. If you lose the finger, for example, the index finger at the DIP joint, this will be 45 times 10, which will give you 4.5% overall loss. Obviously, um, every patient is different, but this does give an, a useful guide. The thumb is critical to overall hand function. The history of thumb reconstruction really spans the history of hand surgery itself. When you're looking at thumb reconstruction, it is not just about the thumb. You have to look at the conditions for opposition, which will be um, the CMC joint and the adequacy of the first web space. You also have to look at the conditions of the remaining fingers. And then lastly, you have to think about the patient's motivation and expectations. Not every patient would want a toe-to-thumb reconstruction, for example. So this is a useful uh, table uh, to consider uh, when you are reconstructing a thumb. You can easily divide a thumb wound into defects, which are really uh, reconstructed using local flap options, or amputations with loss of length, where the options are mainly microsurgical. We're going to concentrate on thumb defects uh, in this webinar and uh, focus more on the uh, microsurgical options in the next webinar. So when we're looking at the uh, unique challenges of choosing flaps for the hand, the thumb pulp is unique because, as mentioned, it constitutes about 40% of hand function and it plays a vital role in uh, the prehension of the hand. So. When we are choosing a flap for the hand, for example, uh, we need to think. So when we think about the ideal requirements of resurfacing a thumb defect, we need to think durability. Is it going to last? Sensibility. Ideally, it should be sensate. And also, uh, optimally, to use light for light reconstruction. The skin here on the thumb pop is glabrous skin. Um, so we should try as far as possible to uh, replace light for light. Now for superficial defects, the choice is healing by secondary intention versus flaps. In my practice, I would never graft a thumb defect or a fingertip uh, uh, defect. If I think it can take a graft, I think it would often heal by secondary intention. And really for smaller and superficial defects, healing by secondary intention, I think is always better than any grafts. If it's deeper, put a flap on but try not to graft any thumb or fingertip defect. If you're going to leave it to heal by secondary intention, warn the patient it may take up to six weeks and that the thumb tip will be sensitive for at least six months. So when we come back to this uh, defect, if this is a superficial defect, uh, even if it is of a considerable size, um, I think you can leave it to heal by secondary intention and you should get a very good result. What about a deeper defect uh, where the tendon or bone um, is exposed? Which flap should you use? Now, whenever I've given this teaching session, invariably um, two flaps will be mentioned by trainees. And they are the Mobert flap 
and the Fouché flaps. So the problem with the Mobert flap is that when I ask trainees to draw this, this is how they typically draw it. But in reality, the Mobert flap doesn't move very much, probably about a centimeter. So if you're going to use a Mobert flap, often you have to flex the IP joint, uh, and this may result in a long-term flexion contracture. Now, there are some nuances of the Mobert flap which we have to uh, think about. The Mobert flap can be designed on the thumb based on the two proper digital arteries because it has a very reliable dose of blood supply. So you cannot do this on the finger because the finger uh, does not have the same robust, reliable dose of blood supply. Also, you have to remember that the blood supply to the Mobert flap comes from deep to superficial via the dorsal digital radio uh, artery. So when you're raising the Mobert flap, initially you will go quite uh, superficial, uh, just deep to the proper digital arteries and it's an e relatively easy dissection. However, when you come to the level of the MCP joint, if you just carry on in that same plane, you will cut the blood supply to the Mobert flap. So it's important to remember that at that point, you have to go deep in order to dissect around the various blood supply uh, that fits into the proper digital artery. So this is a short video that uh, demonstrates uh, how to safely raise a mobile flap. So you mark the incision uh, along the mid-lateral lines of the, uh, the thumb, and I usually use a, a V-shaped extension, which uh, allows the donor site to be closed uh, directly. So as mentioned, uh, get just deep to the proper digital artery uh, and then dissect down to the uh, MCP joint and stay above the peritoneum of the FPL. And here's dissecting it on the other side. And this should be, should be a relatively easy dissection. So just, just um, proceed until you reach the level of the MCP joint and then be really careful and go deep, knowing that the feeding vessels come from deep to uh, superficial and then after that, it is just about uh, releasing any fibrous septa, taking great care uh, not to injure any uh, feeding vessels to the proper digital artery. And you should be able to um, free this up uh, to move about a centimeter or so. So tip, use mobile flaps predominantly for more distal defects. And remember that uh, when resurfacing a whole thumb pulp, it may not be the appropriate flap. And do not use it for fingers because the dorsal blood supply uh, is not as reliable. And take great care when dissecting around the MCP joints. Now, the other flap that trainees often mention is the Fouché flap or the kite flap. Um, so let's look at some of the nuances of the kite flap. So this is the original description uh, of the kite flap by uh, Guy Fouché. And it's interesting to note that his indications for the flap when he originally described it was essentially for the dorsal surface of the thumb and also for more proximal target site. Certainly, I found that when I'm dissecting this flap, it may not always reach the thumb uh, tip on the palmar aspect. Um, so these are the sort of the nuances you have to think about. So again, another uh, video to show... Uh, raising of the kite flap. So on the finger, again, you can proceed quite swiftly, cut right down to parotenon, uh, and um, you can dissect this quite quickly until the proximal aspect of the flap, at which point you should, we should really, re really stop. When raising up the pedicle on the ulna aspect, just get down to the EDC tendon and then cut right down to the bone uh, so that the pedicle is safely preserved here. So this is the EDC tendon, and just cut right down to the bone um, and go as proximally as you can at this stage. So it's deep dissection on the uh, ulna aspect. Now on the radial aspect, raise the skin very, very thin as if uh, this is a full thickness skin graft because um, the pedicle is just right underneath the skin. And then after that, once you identify the pedicle of sorts, uh, dissect it um, gently off the underlying first dorsal interosseous muscle. So deep on the ulnar aspect and superficial on the radial aspect. And then 
try to connect the two. So we go again from proximal to distal. Remember, the blood supply goes from deep to superficial. So you may have to take a little cuff of extensor tendon as well. Uh, so this is the critical juncture. So remember, you may have to take a cuff of extensor tendon together with it. And once you've raised it, there you go. I've taken the cuff of extensor tendon there. Dissect it as proximally as possible uh, so that you can uh, allow it to reach to the thumb uh, tip. This is, this is really crucial. If you don't dissect this proximally, it's not going to reach. And here I'm tunneling it across uh, to the um, pulp. So bring it across, let the tunicate down. If it's pink, uh, then it's fine. If it's not pink, put it back again, dissect it more proximally. Uh, when you stretch on the blood vessels, uh, the blood supply may be affected. So we'll just put it back again, dissect it more proximally, and then uh, pull it through again. So a tip, so the tip for the kite flap, when you are starting out doing this flap, use it more for dorsal or proximal volar defects. Remember, it may not reach the thumb tip. Um, take great care when dissecting around the dorsal MCP joint. Remember, you may have to take a cuff of extensor tendon. And when dissecting, remember on the ulna side, uh, dissect right down to bone, uh, adjacent to the EDC, but keep it very superficial on the radial side. And you should be able to safely raise this flap. So um, the kite flap, I think, is ideal for this kind of defect, uh, dorsal aspect of the thumb as a one-stage procedure, um, tendon exposed. Um, but as mentioned, do take great care when you're resurfacing the uh, volar part of the thumb uh, pulp. There are other options, of course. The litter flap is a neurosensory uh, flap from the um, ulna border of the ring finger. Some people use the radial border. You do need to dissect it quite proximally into the palm. Um, so it's quite a lot of dissection. Uh, and then you put a skin graft on the donor site. I think there are uh, specific indications for this flap. For example, if you're doing a uh, orthoplastic reconstruction of the thumb with a, with an eyelid crest and groin flap, and you want to get a sensate uh, um, uh, tip, uh, other, I think if this is an isolated defect, there are other options you can use. Now, don't forget the cross finger flap, which I'm using more and more. I, I think it's a very good flap. It is safe, reliable, sensate. It's very easy to teach a, a trainee. Uh, and in this useful paper, uh, it reminded us really that you don't have to stick to the index finger and you don't have to stick to the middle phalanx. You can use the proximal phalanx or you can also use the middle finger as well as your donor uh, deficit, uh, depending on the um, shape of the patient's hand. So um, I think this is a very good flap. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is that it is two-stage but don't forget this flap. It may be much better to uh, do this flap safely uh, than to uh, lose a, a kite flap uh, because uh, you damage the blood supply, for example. Now, of course, when we come to more uh, extensive uh, thumb defects, uh, then we need to think about other options. So this is a circumferential uh, thumb uh, defect. The skin was pulled off. Uh, by a horse, you can see the uh, distal phalanx, and then on the dorsal aspect, this is the nail bed. So the patient is very keen to keep the thumb. Now, some may choose to amputate the thumb, um, saying that it's quite, uh, saying that it's still quite a functional thumb if you lose it at the IP joint. But remember, when you come back again to this diagram, you are losing about twenty percent of the overall function of the hand. So you could stick the thumb into the uh, chest or into the abdomen, and that's quite a good option as well. Um, you should try your best, I think, to preserve the thumb tip as much as you can. This is a paper by uh, David Bell describing how you can use a, uh, a two flaps um, to cover the uh, dorsal and the volar aspect of the thumb. This is in the uh, upper abdomen area. Of course, there are microsurgical options, and we'll look at that uh, closely in the next uh, webinar. This is a great toe pulp flap. The um, disadvantage of this, of course, is that it is glabrous, it is uh, sensate, and this can be used to resurface the thumb pulp in uh, a one-stage procedure with excellent um, uh, results and very little donor morbidity. 
So in summary, for thumb defects, don't forget the first web space and the fingers, the ideal requirements of a thumb flap, durability, sensibility. Try as far as possible to reconstruct this with uh, light for light skin. Tip options. Uh, think about what reconstructive options uh, you can choose for different uh, defects, whether this is a very distal thumb defect, resurfacing the whole thumb pulp, or the more proximal defect. So by now you should know that for very distal thumb defect, uh, you can uh, reliably use the mobile flap for deeper uh, um, <coughs> defects. Obviously, you can let it heal if it's not deep, for the whole thumb pulp, you can consider using the cross finger flap or a great toe pulp uh, or the kite flap if you have uh, gathered more experience in doing that. But for um, more proximal defects, again, the cross finger flap and reliably you can use the full shave flap or the kite flap. So these are the learning objectives and I hope that I've managed to achieve them for you. Thank you. So <clears throat> just uh, thought I'd quickly share a case uh, following that. So this is a defect on the thumb. And again, sort of uh, just go through your, you know, go through your options, uh, think through the options, what are the different options uh, that can be used to resurface this. So this is actually an ideal indication for the mobile flat because Actually, this is not the whole thumb pulp. This is only half of it, it's more distal. So in this case, this kind of cases are ideal for, for the Moberg flap, okay? Uh, and that should move and that should cover the entire uh, thumb pulp with very good uh, uh, donor scars and the thumb can uh, remain uh, straight. Okay, over, over back to you, uh, Neil, thanks. Thank you, Wee. Um, thank you for that talk. And um, I'd like to move on now to introduce um, another colleague from Ethiopia, uh, Dr. Abraham Gegziabir, who is a general plastic and reconstructive hand surgeon working at the Alert Center and uh, with the Addis Ababa um, uh, University College uh, Hospital. Um, he's going to talk to us today about the limitations of non-surgical uh, reconstruction in the um, upper limb and uh, pushing the boundaries of non-microsurgical non reconstruction. Um, welcome, Dr. Abraham. Thank you. Shall I... so we're just going to load up your talk now. Um, the poll, the poll. Okay, we're going to start with a poll. Here we go. So there's a poll question here from Dr. Abraham. I'll read it out. What do you think would be the appropriate soft tissue cover with good functional outcome for the wound on the dorsum of the hand, along with tendon injury in a resource limited setup? The options are meshed or sheet split thickness skin graft, groin flap, random abdominal flap, PIA flap, ALT can be easily attempted as pedicled flap or a free tissue transfer, or you can select, I would prefer other flaps. We're just waiting for all those results to come in on. The... Okay, we have the results. Um, the top choice, 45% of delegates would go with the uh, groin flap, followed by 18% with a PIA flap, and then uh, 14 to 15% with either random abdominal flap or uh, sheet split thickness skin graft. So uh, a nice mix of answers there. Thank you. Thank hey, you. Dr. Abraham, over to you. We'll just uh, you. load up your talk.
Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Abraham Gabriel Xavier, the general and plastic reconstructive surgeon at the Science University College of Field Science Alert Center. Uh, I just want to thank B first for allowing me to be part of this webinar, and uh, special thanks to uh, Mr. Willam and uh, Mr. Mr. Neil Kahn for inviting me to be part of this uh, webinar. And uh, the, 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 the topic for, for today uh, I'm supposed to present is practice of non-microsurgical soft tissue coverage of the upper extremities in the low and middle income countries uh, pushing the boundaries. Uh, just a brief description regarding to ALERT. ALERT is uh, a center uh, said to be um, that a pioneer for the country in respect to the plastic reconstruction surgery. It has 300 beds uh, with trauma center of 56 beds. It's affiliated to Addis Ababa University, College of Health Science and School of Medicine. We are involving in teaching uh, uh, residents in plastic and reconstruction surgery. And this center is uh, known for uh, uh, good collaborations for with different uh, national and international organizations and one of the strongest uh, uh, collaboration is with uh, BFIRST and uh, because of this collaboration uh, I was one of the, the, the fellow of BFIRST in 2019 and uh, seniors from BFIRST also they, they came in 2017 for workshop in Alert Center and uh, we had uh, really a fine workshops that involves theoretical and practical as well as uh, cadaver dissections that lasts for uh, one week. So uh, uh, still the collaboration is strong and uh, we are going to continue with these collaborations. Coming to uh, the topic, uh, non-microsurgical soft tissue coverage is uh, it falls between a primary closure and free flaps but it requires a careful uh, planning and decisions. Uh, doing um, that name microsurgical soft tissue coverage might be a challenging, particularly in choosing the most appropriate coverage because it has its own consequence with regarding to potential complications and uh, it might also complicate the future management options. But because you don't have any other options, it's the preferred options in, reco in uh, resource limited areas of uh, low income countries. There are common causes of uh, soft tissue losses in, in our practice and uh, one of the, 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 the common issue is regarding trauma and uh, soft tissue losses because of burn infections particularly with uh, uh, necrotized soft tissue infections, IV medications, and uh, patients with diabetes mellitus are commonly seen with infections. Gross, benign, and malignant, uh, there are issues, uh, particularly after uh, wide excisions, and uh, these are some of the commonly seen causes for soft tissue coverage. There are ideal environments and uh, which we, we, we hope to have, and uh, but there are also facts on the ground. And uh, one of the issues is type of surgeries we are planning to do and the duration of the surgery that is going to take and uh, operating times that we are allowed. And the other is skilled presence of skilled manpower and uh, having a service that is uh, 24 hours. That's also another issue. And another common issue is that uh, presentation, particularly with the patients, because there are few centers working on, on, on these areas. So patients are coming late and other issues are that instruments. And uh, so having these factors um, that like uh, the presence of skill of the surgeons, working environment, patient uh, preference, like patients sometimes, if you are going to choose with the flaps, they might, they might uh, prefer to have skin grafts. So it's not only with the science, but uh, 
Sometimes patients are, because they are coming from the far area, they don't want to be admitted, they want to have um, that quick fix. By going back to their uh, home village, so that, that, that's also another issue. Another is uh, anesthesia, uh, whether to use local anesthesia versus regionals or wallants. Well, that's also another issue with uh, soft tissue coverage. So it's not only uh, choosing between the reconstruction ladders or uh, elevators, but uh, having the previous factors that I mentioned as we go for reconstruction ladders or elevators. Uh, if things are uh, really suitable, we go for elevators. But uh, if things are not um, that workable, then we go for primarily with the uh, reconstruction ladders. So depending on that factor, some that we have different patients. Uh, these are some of the examples. Uh, starting from the fingers, I'm going to show some of the, the uh, cases that we are facing uh, with fingers, web spaces, thumb, uh, hand, the forearm and the arm. And uh, from fingers, I'm that this is a patient with uh, has uh, uh, soft tissue losses on the palmar aspect of the, 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 the fingers of the uh, middle and ring. And from the participants in the webinars and also the panelists might raise issue of Hamzat choosing other uh, method of, method of um, that, uh, tissue coverage. But taking Hamzat um, all the factors I mentioned, Hamzat um, would it uh, skin graft for the patient. And similar things are also being repeatedly done with either full thickness or split thickness graft, particularly patients with uh, possible contractures. Uh, there are attempts, and uh, there are, it's also another common practice to do the cross uh, finger flaps, uh, especially in patients with uh, losses on the index fingers or in the middle fingers, where the middle you know, and that uh, the ring fingers where the middle finger is the donor, that's one one common hidden uh, flaps. But uh, the challenge might be in patients with uh, loss on the middle fingers, where the, the, the cross finger uh, flap might not be an easy uh, task. Uh, for me, I'm that uh, this is one of the, the least favored methods. To, to, to cover the soft tissue on the, the tip of the finger. This is one of the, the earlier uh, pictures in, in my practice. But later on, I'm that uh, I, I preferred the, the previous one, either the cross fingers or the other flaps. Uh, I just, but still we are doing this, uh, uh, either the chest wall or the abdominal flaps, particularly in patients with uh, multiple finger tip injuries where uh, Donor sites might be uh, the issue, or sometimes um, that the time of surgery might be easy. I'm um, that doing uh, across um, that chest wall or abdominal flaps. Regarding to the thumb, uh, thumb is an issue because it needs uh, uh, sensitive glabrous skins preferred, but uh, still sometimes we do skin grafts. Uh, because of the, the skills or because of the patient preference or sometimes uh, because of just uh, the, the time factors. Uh, other option is uh, particularly on the tip of the thumb is uh, the first dorsal metacarpal artery flaps. That's also another common leader that's tunneled through the, the, the skins or in some of the patients we directly do the, the, the like across uh, finger uh, pattern of um, that uh, tissue cover. And uh, mobile flap is also commonly done in, 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 in traumas, in particularly in our trauma centers. So these are some of the, 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 the flaps in fingers. Uh, still the, the least ones in the, in the thumb is also the, the either abdominal or chest wall, but uh, there are people um, that prefer to, to do this one. 
Uh, in cases where we, we, need, we need redundant of tissues, like for further reconstructions, like this patient, where there is a loss in the, the thumb and also dorsal of the hand, where you need a sort of um, the soft tissues that uh, later on to be used to reconstruct the thumb. In that case, we, we go for uh, an area where we can get a redundant skin, like uh, a growing flaps. So the purpose is it's not only covering the soft tissue, but also having them that another extra tissue for later on and that when you are doing a bone graft as a finger thumb posting. Pushing the boundaries because we don't, I mentioned we don't have um, that uh, the microsurgery units. So reimplantation might not be possible, but uh, we are doing the alternatives. That means filleting all the soft tissues, including the tendons, uh, the, the fingers, everything. So we use uh, the skeletons as, uh, as a graft and uh, we immobilize that one with uh, K wires that's buried inside. And then uh, the whole thing is going to be buried into the groins. And after three weeks, then we release that, release that one. So if that is in case of thumb, we attempt this type of soft tissue coverage. For first web spaces, uh, definitely that's an issue. Uh, this is my finger, and uh, the purpose is just to have a space as big as, as this one's, and uh, the common uh, uh, flap that we, we use, we use, we use it you know, as a uh, posterior torsion uh, flap, that is the reverse ones, Regarding to the technique, at least time that uh, I think the, the one of the, the senior is going to discuss in detail. Don't move the hand, skin graft might be the, the, the options, or you can have also um, that uh, uh, the common horse work um, that flap is a growing flap. Other issues regarding to the reverse posterior interventions flaps. Or sometimes, if the area is so big one, then after doing uh, allen test, checking the ulnar artery, the, the radial forearm flaps, the reverse one is also another issue. Uh, there are times where you are supposed to either combine or you might go for uh, a simple one. That's uh, a patient with uh, forearm where there is a big area with. Uh, uh, soft tissue loss, and uh, the ideal one that we choose for this patient is split thickness skin grafts. But in times where there is a deep tissue are, are exposed, uh, we go for uh, uh, local or regional flaps. In this case, um, that we base that from the inferior superficial inferior epigastric artery flaps to cover the elbow. That is one, one, one option. Uh, combination is also another issue, means flaps and skin graft. And on that on that particular patient, we, 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 we plan to graft this one and to put a flap so that the purpose of the flap is for later on the patient can have the polarization of the index finger. In the elbow and the arm, uh, uh, lateral arm flap is one commonly I personally prefer, particularly the reverse ones to, to cover the elbow so that the patient uh, can have um, that a good flexion extensions. And sometimes uh, we, we, we prefer to put the skin graft on the donor side and uh, rather than on the elbow. On the, on the arm, uh, there are times you can, you, can, you can get the patients after electrical burn injuries, or sometimes with a uh, sort of um, that uh, strangulating uh, string injuries, where we excise that one and uh, prefer to cover with uh, the latmus dorsi, latmus dorsi, myocutanis flaps. But this is a patient uh, uh, who, who lost um, that big soft tissue, uh, including the muscles, the biceps, and uh, Coracobrachialis, uh, sorry, 
And uh, for this one, the, the, the plan was not only soft tissue coverage, but also the, the functional muscle transfer. So we did for this patient with the uh, Mr. Dorsey microphone plan. These are some of the cases where it's, which is difficult to answer. Uh, where you choose, to, you might choose to, to do the microsurgery uh, transfers, but uh, for us, because it's not uh, available, we, we, we use uh, sort of an abdominal wrap-up type of flaps. And uh, this is also another patient where we did a combination of uh, uh, flaps, where uh, we use flaps on the palm and on the forearm where the lip structures are exposed and the rem remaining part is uh, covered by the skin graft. So that we use the, the groins as well as the, the flaps that is based on the superficial inferior epigastric artery. So uh, additionally, the collateral on that uh, it's the other side of the, the groin flaps is also used to, to cover the tissue. So. In, in, in time, some that we, we are obliged to combine flaps, not only flaps, but also uh, flaps and skin grafts. So these are some of the, the, the techniques that we are using to cover our sort of coverage. Thank you very much. Uh, Neil, uh, there's a couple of very good questions coming in. Can I just... Uh, of course. Read? Maybe get Abraham or, or Raja or whoever to answer. And, and I think after Raja's talk, I, I think some of these questions will be answered. But I I I I, I want to uh I want to ask uh uh Abraham or Raja about this question. But Dan it's uh the Marque, when you choose to do a cross chest abdominal or groin flap for a degler finger or thumb, uh do you tubalize the flap or do you just make an opening and bury the uh the glove part? No, how, do, how do you know? Should... How do you know? How do you know what to do and uh, how long is it? Yeah, Raja, yeah. sorry. No, I don't usually bury the flaps. You know, I usually make a tubed flap, and usually make them thin. The problem is if you tube, the people worry that it'll be a bulky flap. So in my talk, I'll tell you how to thin the flap. You know, primarily, how you uh, thin, so that uh, that makes it easier. The problem is if you bury the flap sometimes, so you have to be very careful. If there's an inadequate debridement, you'll get a cellulitis of the abdominal wall. Okay, so that's the very, very thing when you're in a resource uh, restrained countries. Uh, the most important is debridement. If you have a chap, if you bury the hand or bury fingers, with a little bit of inadequate debridement, you can run the risk of a cellulitis of the abdominal wall. Thanks, Roger. Abraham, mm -hmm. do you do you tube the flap usually? No, I, I don't. In fact, tube the, the flap. But uh, rather, sometimes I use like uh, the burying the flap, but to use that was a crane type of flap. I mean that burying the finger so that it gets uh, proper gravulations. Then you can have um, that either full thickness or sheet split thickness skin graft so that it's not going to be easy for both for donor side as well as for. That might, otherwise, when you are um, that doing the second uh, harvesting, usually, as I have shown on the on the slides, usually it gets bulky and uh, particularly in kids, when you do that one, um, that later on, um, that at the age of 12, something they will come with uh, when they get a little bit fatty, they, they will have the same thing on the tip of the fingers and they need developing. So, Usually, I, 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 if I do, I'm that uh, the abdominal or, or chest wall. I prefer to do the, the crane type. Thanks, Abraham. It's, it's great work what you're doing uh, in Ethiopia. That was a great talk. And I think, I think Raja, also, I think uh, you have already actually also answered another question. Uh, Kiran uh, said that he hates the ALT flap and groin flap due to their bulk. Mm -hmm. I think in your talk later, you teach us how to thin yeah, it, isn't yeah. it? Okay, we'll yeah, leave yeah. it. There's one more question is what is the sensory recovery uh, in chest and abdominal flap? Maybe you can address that as well in your talk, okay? Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, Neil, back to you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Wee. Um, and thank you, Abraham, for that talk. Uh, so moving on, um, I'm going to welcome uh, Hank Gill. 
Uh, Henk is a consultant hand, wrist and plastic surgeon uh, working at the Radcliffe Infirmary in Oxford, uh, where he's also a researcher and clinical lecturer at Queen's College, Oxford. And we're fortunate to have him join us on our inaugural uh, B First BSSH hand workshop in uh, the Alert Center in Ethiopia. So uh, thank you, Hank, for coming on today to speak to us about um, you, what you've learned over the years, pearls and pitfalls on, uh, for specific flat harvests. Thank you. Um, I hope you can see my screen now. Is that working all right? Yep, uh, yep, I can see. Perfect. And can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Oh, excellent. Right. Um, my brief was pedicle flaps in the hand, uh, but we don't have much time. We've got 20 minutes. So I thought instead what I would do is concentrate on one particular flap, which is the pastriotrosseous flap, um, also called the PIA flap. And the um, I, I sometimes refer to it as the 5-6 dorsal intercompartmental septal artery flap, and you'll understand why um, later on during my talk. And um, it's a very good flap for defects such as this, uh, covering the back of the hand, the back of the finger up to the PIP joint, uh, and the first web space. So here is an example with that defect, a PIA flap being raised, pedicled distally and then being transferred. And the arc of rotation is sort of like that. So it's good for the back of the hand, first web space, uh, back of the fingers up to the PIP joint, side of the hand, carpal tunnel, if you bring it around the ulnar aspect. The, there are some keys to doing it, which I'm going to go through in sequence. Um, but this is the sort of thing that's good for back of the hand, first web space, up to the PIP joint, this sort of traumatic defect on the dorsum of the hand with exposed tendons. Um, and one of the keys about this flap is the design. And there are two problems with the design that are um, evident. One is that the description of how to draw the surface markings is to draw a line from the lateral epicondyle to the distal radial ulnar joint. Um, but you will see on this flap example here that this scar is much more ulnar. That's the line from the lateral epicondyle to the distal radial ulnar joint, which is what's described as how you should design the flap. But if you based a flap and you drew it on that axis, you would miss the blood vessels that travel on this axis. And this axis is the septum between the extensor carpi ulnaris, the sixth extensor compartment, and the extensor digitum minimi, the fifth extensor compartment. Um, and the second problem with the design is that if you call it the distally based posterior interosseous artery flap, everybody knows where the posterior interosseous artery is. It lies next to the posterior interosseous nerve, which is lies in the fourth uh, the floor of the fourth compartment, which is over here, where the extensor digitorum cumuni pass. And so if you know in your head that the postrontrosseous nerve sits here and the PIA sits here, then surely that must be the pivot point and base of your flap, which it is not. And that is why people run into trouble and do this flap and then discover actually it's not working because they're not doing it properly because their brain overrides um, the information because they know it's called the PIA flap and that the PIA flap is here. That's why I think, oh, if you call it the 5-6 intercompartmental septal artery flap, everyone will know the 5-6 septum sits here between ECU and EDM and that is the correct line of the flap. Um, so let me just advance the slides. So here is a, uh, an anatomical illustration. Uh, lateral epicondyle is here of the humerus. So if you draw a line from lateral epicondyle here to the distal radial ulnar joint, and normally it's not the distal radial ulnar joint, but it's a, a pivot point just below it, and where you can feel that divot um, where the neck of the 
ulna starts to expand and the radius forms the sigmoid notch. Um, so about here. And so if you draw that line, you will be too radial. And so if you draw your flap too radial, you'll miss all the perforators that travel along the, I'm sorry to keep repeating it, the fifth, sixth intercompartmental septal artery, which is here between EDQ and ED, ECU. So it's a EDQ, ECU septal flap. And if you know that, then that will work. Um, and the, the bony landmark for that is if you take the lateral epicondyle and the olecranon and you split that distance in two, that will sort of give you the rough idea. Uh, here's another drawing that I did. So the, the posterior artery comes up from the radial artery through the septum, proximal part of the septum, has a recurrent branch going back to the lecranon, splits into two branches. And this branch here, is, which is the true PIA, is often vestigial until it forms an anastomosis with the anterior entrostis artery just above pronated quadratus here, um, and then recurs. And another branch that, that goes here in the five, six septum, and that's what this vessel is based on. And at the distal end of the wrist, this anastomosis with the true PIA, the anterior entrostis artery through the septum, uh, and the dorsal carpal arch. So that's the line, or, uh, sorry, let me just go back. So a normally drawn line would be lateral condyle and would be this dotted line here, two radial. Split the difference and go halfway between that line, but the lateral condyle that you can palpate and the lecheron and draw a line here. And that would be in the correct septum and the correct course of the artery. Of course, um, if the patient is thin or you can palpate them, it's much better to palpate the septum because then you don't have to rely on bony landmarks. Bony landmarks are really only used when the patients are too large for you to feel the muscular definition. Uh, this is my forearm, and you can see here my olecranon, my lateral epicondyle. This is extensor carpi ulnaris. This is extensor digiti quinti. This is the septum running along here. So you can palpate it. So you don't need bony landmarks at all. Just feel the septum and then draw your line along there. It depends a bit on how you position your arm. So when you're drawing it, position the arm with the elbow flexed, arm and, and the forearm rotation in neutral. If you over pronate like this guy here, sorry, over supinate like this guy here, you can see that the line, if I drew from lateral epicondyle to distal on joint would be way too radial it would miss the septum completely. And the same here with this guy's over pronated. So if you went from lateral to condyle to disradial joint, you would miss the septum. So you've got to put position the arm in neutral if, you would do, if you're going to use landmarks. If you're not using landmarks, just palpate it. It's infinitely easier. So then you can draw the line and you can see that's a normal descriptive line, lateral condyle to disradial joint, it misses the septum. And if you do that, you'll miss the perforators and your flat will die. That's the line you want, but ignore the landmarks, palpate it. Uh, another important point is that the emergence of the posterior entrostis artery into the arm and the start of the septal artery is about the junction of the proximal third and the distal two thirds. So here's the proximal, split the forearm into three and the junction between the proximal third and the distal two thirds will give you the point of emergence of the posterior entrostis artery. All the perforators lie between this point and the wrist. There are no perforators proximal. There is a recurrent branch, but it doesn't give skin perforators. So if you designed a skin flap that started here and ended here and was there, it will die. It will have no perforators in it. If you want to include a skin flap here because you want it to be long by the time you get to the hand, then you have to collect skin here as well, so that the perforators can come here into the skin paddle and then retrograde run through the skin paddle. So we'll see, see a clinical example later. So if you get the forearm and you're doing your markings and you put a, a, a spot here, make sure that whatever your flap is, it picks up perforators distal to this spot. Here's an example. Uh, distal radiator on the joint is marked. This is the septum that's marked. Here's the olecranon. Here's the lateral epicondyle. 
So the line is not lateral epicondyle to distal radial joint. It's halfway between lateral epicondyle and lecranon. But actually, you can palpate it. This guy's nice and thin. This is the one third marking. So from, from here to this part of the skin flap here, this part of the flap is random, does not get any perforators. So we have to pick up a perforator somewhere here to supply this bit. Now, you might not need any skin flap here on where you, ever your defect is, but you have to collect this skin with it. So you might have to make a defect in order to put that skin in. So uh, this is to show the vessel is in the septum running up. Uh, it's not particularly useful, but, um, and this is what not to do. Uh, here's a description from somebody else who said, uh, we do PIA flap like this. You dissect the, the flap and come down until you find the PIA vessel, giving its branches at the base of the fourth compartment, just proximal to the uh, interosseous membrane, and then you can follow it. Uh, you can do this, but it makes it very difficult. This makes it a complicated flap because you're here at the source of the vessel. This is like doing a groin flap and trying to find the groin flap vessel near your femoral artery rather than finding it laterally and following it in. So what I suggest you do is you find it distally and then follow it in. This is how I do it. You mark your distal radial joint. You, you follow your line, not from lash epicondyle, but halfway between the two, or you palpate extensor carpi ulnaris so you can mark the line. You mark the junction uh, of proximal third and distal two thirds. So you know you have to pick up perforators here or this bit will die. Um, planning in reverse. This flap is being used to widen the first web space. So I put the gauze in around the first web space. I put a dot at the base of the flap. I put my thumb at the pivot point, spin the, spin the bit of gauze around. And so I know my flap needs to be at least that long add 20% for uh, tension and stuff. And the dot will tell you where the flap starts. Draw your flap in. So this flap uh, probably only needs to be that long, but I've made it extra long here to make sure I pick up perforators and to make the, the elevation of the flap easy. If I only go here, then I have to pick up perforators that are very close to the origin of the postgenterosis artery. And that is complicated. If you pick up perforators that are closer to the wrist, it makes life very much easier and much quicker. I commence res uh, elevating the flap by doing an incision from the apex of the flap to the wrist along that line. I elevate the skin. If I'm concerned that the flap is big uh, or that venous drainage may be difficult, I preserve a subcutaneous vein to help super drain the flap. Uh, as you elevate this, I incise over the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon. And the, as you pull extensor carpi ulnaris tendon away, sometimes you will see perforators going to skin, which tells you that's the, that you're in the right place. But if you don't see them, don't worry. But you will see here, this is ECU. This is the septum. Extensor digiti minimi is on the other side, but you'll see little perforators here, 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 and, that, and they're coming from the vessel. You can't see the vessel yet. If you then, uh, oops, it's not advancing. Uh, that confirms that you're in the right line and you can then dissect and follow the vessel proximally. And you will see here, this is the vessel. Um, distally, it's superficial, just under deep fascia. As you go proximally, it, become, it goes deeper down through the depths over the bellies of, um, ab, uh, of um, APL and EPB. This is EDQ here. Um, and you'll see the little branches going off to the muscle and also these perforators going to skin. This tiny perforator here is sufficient to keep this patch of skin alive. So if you follow this vessel up to here and divide it here, that's a really quick flap to raise. You do not have to worry about chasing this pedicle, this perforator here, because this one will be hard to do because it all gets very complicated down here as the vessel intertwines with the patient process nerve. And if you have to start operating down here, that's when people get palsies of their extensor digital minimi. So this is perfect. So taking this bit of extra skin was a wise thing to do because we could pick up this perforator. 
If we'd started the flat at this level, then we would have not been able to use this perforator and that would have made life more difficult. Then the flap is raised uh, and you follow it distally. And if your pedicle is long enough, then you can leave it where it has a transverse anastomosis to the real posterior entrosis artery, and which in turn has an anastomosis with the anterior entrosis artery. Uh, if not, you can keep going distally, but we'll come to that later. Uh, so that's the arterial pedicle. This is an extravenous pedicle. You don't always need it. Most of the time I don't use it. It's just um, if you're concerned about venous drainage. Most of the time the VCs here next to the artery are much bigger than the artery and they are sufficient. Uh, so having raised the flap, this is my technique of delivering it to the defect. Um, this is all degloved uh, underneath so the, the pedicle can pass subcutaneously. This is a flap that is passed, uh, sorry, this is a glove that's passed through. The flap can then be placed inside the glove and then you can pull the glove through and that way you make sure that your pedicle doesn't get twisted. So you can see the pedicle here gets pulled through, make sure it's not too tight at the pivot point and then you can inset it. And when you're dressing it, I always leave it exposed so that you can see if it's becoming blue, if in case you need to change the tension or in worst case scenario, put it back where it came from to delay it and then put it back uh, a week later. Another example, expose the 5-6 septum. Uh, first, elevating the skin flaps, exposing the deep fascia. Again, I've kept a superficial vein. A cut over extensor carpi ulnaris. Then another cut, which I haven't done yet here, over extensor digit minimi. Then once you've done that, you can lift them up Lift it up from the extensor digit minimi side because the vessel lies on the extensor digit minimi side. As you lift it up, you may see the vessel hugging the deep surface of the deep fascia. The vessel is sometimes so tiny you cannot see it, but it is always there. Uh, once you're sure that this line is the correct line for the axis of the flap, elevate your flap. As you elevate your flap, you'll find perforators coming up. And once you've found one, uh, good perforator, you don't need to dissect anymore. So that makes life very easy. So this perforator here going into the base of the flap is enough to keep all this flap alive. So then you can you divide it just uh, proximal to that perforator. And then the rest of it is easy to elevate. So, so that perforator is here. Um, and then you don't need to take any else of that vessel. So the vessel it ends here. Same technique with the glove to pull it through. Now, in order to get enough skin here, I designed the flap so that it was, it's longer than I need, but you need that bit in order to pick up that easy perforator that was here. The bit of skin I really needed was this bit. And I could have just taken this bit and kept a small flap. Then I would have had to use this perforator here. That means lots more dissection, lots more time. It's much easier just to do that. And then you have got too much flap. So just make your defect bigger. That way um, you can use that easy perforator, makes it an easy flap. Big flaps, beautiful. Make sure the, the, the pedicle is not um, too tight. Stitch it in, I don't always use a drain. Leave it exposed so you can check that it's all right. I use a plaster usually to keep the wrist extended so that they don't end up in an awkward position. This is a bit of video, I think if it can start. Uh, because now, nah, hang on, let me just turn the sound off. Um, oh, what's the video control? So, that's my design, an incision over the distal part. In this case, I'm not going to keep the superficial vein. It's a relatively small flap. 
So you just elevation the skin flaps superficial. So you leave the deep fascia intact. Uh, don't use a Esmar. This patient's not under tourniquet, but normally um, don't use an Esmar so that you don't um, exsanguinate the vessel. That way you can see it. You can see ECU, put an incision over ECU on, through the deep fascia. Then ECU is then exposed. And then put an incision over center digital minimi. So the distance between the two incisions, a bit like tram tracks, is about a centimeter. If you lift up the fascia now over EDQ, EDM, and, and look underneath it towards the septum, which you will see in a minute, okay, I'm lifting EDQ away, that is the vessel. You can't see it, it's tiny. Uh, sometimes it's very small, but, but trust in it, it's there. So I'm just elevating the C. And you can you can't really see, but you have to trust there is a, a little vessel in the in the junction. So now I've checked that that's in line with the flap. I can then cut the flap. So I'm just going to elevate the flap, elevate the other side. This is this video is not sped up. It's real time. Okay, this flap elevation takes ten minutes maybe. So the flap is elevated. You don't need all the deep fascia over EDC, that just complicates matters. So you can lift that up until you're back in line with sensitivity minimi. And there I've seen a perforator already. Here's the perforator, okay? That's coming up between ED, EDQ and e, uh, EDM and um, extensor carpi onaris. So that's the perforator I'm going to use. You can see it there. So incise one side and follow the, the um, tram track on the other side. Good. Now, there's another little perforator here, but this is the, this is the nice one. It's going to keep the flap alive. I'm retracting extensor digital minimi away. This is the septum. You can just about make the vessel here. Okay, superficial at the wrist and as it comes proximally, it goes deeper. So here's the vessel. So I'm dissecting deep to the vessel so that I can follow the vessel. And I only need to follow it until it is just proximal to this perforator. So that makes your dissection much easier because if you keep going all the way to the origin of it, it becomes complicated with branches to all the muscles, winding around the petrointrosseous nerve. But there you can, you can see the vessel here, okay? So the origin of the vessel is down here. You can see how complicated it becomes here, but, that, but actually this perforator is sufficient. And then it gives off this big perforator and here's the continuation of the vessel running in the septum of EDQ here. I'm now going to get a Liger clip and Liger clip the vessel here. And another one, I never trust those Liger clips. I put a few extra in, a couple for the intermuscular branches. Okay, divide the vessel proximally. Keep the perforator that's going to the skin flap. I'm now cutting the septum deep to the artery, deep to the vessel. Okay, cutting through it. So there you are cutting through it. And then Distally, you can just cut as much as you like because there's no vessel there. So now I'm deep to the I'm deep to the vessel, cutting the septum. Oh, here's a little muscle branch. Just going to buzz that.
just see the vessel there. As long as you're deep to it, keep the vessel in the pedicle. Little branch. Okay, following it up to the to the distal anastomosis. And there are lots of anastomoses distally, so don't worry if you prang one, there's always another one. When you get down to where you where you you can see sort of other branches, turn it around, see if it will do what you want it to do. If you're not happy about the tension, then just keep dissecting a bit more distally. Okay, so not quite happy with how tight that is. So I'm going to buzz that perforator branch. That will give me a couple more centimeters if I keep following that up. And then if I'm happy with how it is, that's the um, that's your PIA flap done. Okay. And and just make sure that put that pedicle is not too tight, close your defect. That's it. And it's and it, if you do it like that, it is a quick easy, reliable flap that that is not sped up. That's completely real time. OK, less than 10 minutes. And that's how it should be. And this is how you pass it through the. Um, uh, with the glove. Bring your glove in. That's you've made your tunnel. Make sure it's not twisted. Light in the glove so it's ready to go. Pull it through, then you know that the pedicle doesn't twist. And you pull the glove through, and then your flap's delivered. And if there's too much skin under here, you just make the cut bigger so there's more skin exposed. Double check that this isn't tight here. Okay, so. Uh, I don't think we need to, that's some more examples. You can also do a fascia cutaneous one like this, where you, in fact, you elevate the skin. And if it's very big, you're just using the fascia over it rather than the skin. So that's an alt alternative. So that you're using fascia and then skin graft over the top. And if you're trying to cover something very distal, uh, like PIP joint, DIP joint, then you can um, exteriorize the pedicle. So the pedicle does a shortcut. Or instead of relying on this anastomosis here, you divide this anastomosis and keep dissecting the vessel so it relies on the dorsal carpal arch. Um, but this is an example of an exteriorized pedicle, a guy with a trashed hand. Uh, we fixed him, put corticocancellous bone graft in, but you see this defect extends all the way up to the DIP joint, traditionally too far for a PIA flap. So I did an exteriorized pedicle PIA flap. You see the pedicle going outside the hand. Um, and so that does work. Unfortunately, this guy was put in an oven on the ward with a cardboard box and a, and a bear hugger, which um, cooked his flap. When I came in the morning, it was a bit like this, crispy. So that had to go in the bin. And I fixed it with a free um, flap, uh, scapular flap, I think. Can't remember. Anyway, so. Um, in conclusion, the PIA flap, it has a bad reputation, but it's a very excellent flap. Uh, you can use a very large one if you skin graft the do donor defect. If you design and execute it um, in the method that I've shown, it is easy and very reliable. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Hank. Just one question for you from the audience. I think you probably answered that already. 
I don't know how to start. Do you routinely Doppler the vessel before you start or you just go for it? Hank? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Do, do you Doppler the vessel ever? No, no, okay. you don't need to because you know where it is. Okay. It, it's always there. It is in the 5 6 septum. Uh, it's, it, you either feel the 5 6 septum or you um, explore it by doing that longitudinal incision proximal to the distal radial ulnar joint. Okay. Thanks. And, and the more proximal and the more distal you are, the more perforators there are. So if you're worried and you want to be a million percent certain that this will work, take a skin flap that extends all the way to the distal radial ulnar joint. There, there are thousands of perforators. Not, okay, not thousands. I take that back. Mm. There are tens of perforators. But you only need one. And, and if you pick up a distal one, it makes your flap dissection so easy because you don't need any of the proximal ones. Okay. Are there any instances where you might choose this? Oh, uh, choose the uh, radio forum flap, the distally radio, uh, distally based radio forum flap over the PIA. Would you ever use the radio forum flap? Uh the pedicle one, I mean. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> would I ever? Of course, it, I would ever if. There was some reason, I, but but PIA flap would be my primary choice. Okay. Um, because it doesn't it doesn't um, damage a principal artery. Even if you do a radial artery perforator radial flap, um, this is just easier, quicker, more reliable. Um, I I'd see no reason to do a radial forearm flap unless there was some defect that it, that this yeah. couldn't reach. Damage to the uh, dorsum of the hand, for example. Now. Um, have you ever encountered venous congestion? Of course not, isn't it? Of course <laughs> I have. No, no, no. <laughs> of course. So, which is why I say, so that's why there was some examples. And what do you do there. when you get that? So that's why, that's why some of the examples include a superficial vein. So if you are taking a very big flap, particularly a big flap that includes a large proportion of the random area proximal to the proximal third uh, or in the proximal third, up to the olecranon, right? Uh, then I would try and include a superficial vein in that section. So you've got the artery being fed by the um, uh, the five six yep. in compartment <laughs> septal artery, but the vein, apart from the VC, has extra drainage through a dorsal, through a superficial vein, and um, venous drainage sometimes becomes congested. It normally resolves. I um, it, it, it is, the venous problem is more of a problem than the arterial problem. So of, I don't know, a couple of hundred PIA flaps, I've won, lost one to arterial insufficiency um, and maybe a couple from venous insufficiency. And, but it's, it's a relatively small majority. And most of the time it, I was pushing the size uh, and expanse of the flap. I was doing, a, you know, I was trying like that exteriorized pedicle. I mean, you know, who in their right mind would do that? That's just bonkers. But, but, but you can, and uh, most of the time you get away with it, but, but sometimes um, you don't like when they cooked it. But so if you, if you need to supercharge it, you can supercharge it, but actually you could super drain it just by including that superficial vein along the pedicle. Okay. Do you keep this flap mini for defects where you can close the donor site? And that bigger defects, you use a free flap, uh, or do you sometimes graft the donor site, which is a lot of people complain that it doesn't look very, very good on the dorsal. It doesn't look good. And so, no, if, if it's a situation where um, if it's a young lady or I don't want to leave a dorsal scar, I mean, I, I, my preference is to do a free flap, but that's because I, I'm in a situation where I can. And, yeah. but if you're in this, but, and, but, you know, this is a quick flap. So if I'm in a situation where I, I don't have the facility or I have time pressure or whatever, or the guy doesn't care about the scar or something, then you can do it. And yes. If, if you take a wider flap, do you take more perforators? No, wider okay. makes no difference. Longer, okay. longer gives you more perforators. So okay. if you need a wide flap, make it long. If you need a, okay. if you need a flap very distally to your fingertip, make it long. And, and that, so sometimes you have a defect, you know, that's on your finger that needs a flap, but, but actually most of the flap is inset in the back of the hand. 
and that's carrying this bit. That's fine, because I might throw this bit away later. It's just doing its job. It's, it's, the, it's the carrier. Fantastic. I think you've answered all the questions. Thanks, Hank. Over to you, Neil. Thank you, Hank. Um, I'd like to move on now um, and introduce our next speaker, who uh, really needs no introduction. Um, we are honoured to have uh, Professor uh, Raja Sabapati join us here today for the webinar um, uh, to talk about his experience with uh, groin and abdominal flap reconstruction in the upper limb. Um, Professor Sabapati is the uh, chairman of the Division of Plastic uh, Hand and Reconstructive Surgery at Ganga Hospital in India. He's also the current president of the Asian Pacific Hand Society and Secretary General of IFSSH and has a, a vast experience in both microsurgical and non-microsurgical reconstruction in the upper limb. Uh, welcome, Professor Sabapati. Uh, thanks, Neil. It's always a pleasure to uh, join any of the webinars of the uh, British Hand Society. All right, I'll share the screen. Is it okay? Is it okay? Uh, yeah, that's great. We can see that. Yeah, right. Uh, when we send a mail the first time, right, he just put groin and abdominal flaps for large defects. You know? So I made this talk for large, large defects. I saw it last night and found it as uh, the large was not there. But it doesn't matter. You know? We do it on large and then you know, we can extrapolate it to uh, small defects. See, if you're working in a developing country, I think for, for that matter, anyway, the most important thing is that whatever you do, I think you should trust that the procedure will consistently be successful. I think as well, the PAA flap is concerned, and I totally agree with Hank, it's one of the most reliable flaps. I totally endorse his views. So groin flap and abdominal flaps are again a very trust principle that they could be your workhorses. And second, it must be easy to do. And the outcome that we get must be easily reproduced by any good surgeon. And in a developing economy, I think that's sort of the Ganga Hospital principle is that now you need to keep down the cost of care. And if you have to reduce, keep the cost of care down, is that quality care is the best way to reduce the cost of care. I always find it's the complications which increase the cost of care. So you mustn't have flap failure and you mustn't have infection. I think these are the two things you now which uh, raise the complications. And if you have to reduce the flap failure, that means you need to be well grounded in anatomy. And this is a figure in which I like all of you to remember. I think it's a femoral artery, it's a circumflex iliac artery. This is about the groin territory. This is the hypogastric flap territory, super inferior epigastric. That's the superficial external pudentum. And that's the anticipated expand. I think this, uh, marking the anticipated expand is very important because. And the, everything, you know, the groin territory comes two fingers below the anterior leg spine. If somebody marks the anterior leg spine on the iliac crest, then what will happen is you know, you'll be very far away. I think that's the problem. If you want to have this flap in base like this, these are the vessels you have to think. Suppose if it is superiorly based, you need to all these parametric perforators that come up, you know, so that you can raise all of it. So literally, you can raise one whole half of this flap, whole half of this abdomen, almost going to the posterior abdominal, posterior axillary line, based on these vessels coming over here. If you leave this, I have found that even in the bulky people, the distance between these, where this gets out of the outer border of the sartorius, and does the inguinal ligament, is only about six or seven centimeters, even in bulky people. Okay, so you could make this uh, narrow, the base narrow, and you could raise flaps, big flaps you could raise. I think that's the point that you have to remember. Uh, the refinements that we did was, uh, when you make flaps, you need to keep the base narrow because uh, if you keep the base wide, then the mobility becomes restricted. That means you can't insert it. I think that's what makes it difficult. Increasing the insert you know, increases the comfort of the patient. See, because when you do a pedicle flap, the common thing told you, groin is uncomfortable flap. Yeah, it's uncomfortable if you plan it not properly. If you plan it properly, it's not uncomfortable. Increasing the insert increases the comfort of the patient and makes the flap connect well to the bed. Otherwise, now you just attach it and it just goes off and you know, it's uh, hanging in the air. 
Second thing is uh, keeping the length of the pedicle. Conventionally, it used to be taught that comfort means you need to have a long pedicle. That means the hand goes like this, that. Yeah, I don't think it's a good idea. Then what really happens is if you keep a long pedicle, you waste the uh, flap, which has got a good blood supply, it just gets all wasted in the pedicle, and then you have a, a flap which is in the business end, you know, which is not very good. So for any flap, if you want to succeed, you know, I, I'm uh, whatever anybody wants me to talk, I always talk about this because a good flap cannot compensate bad deprivation. So you need to deprive. So speaking of large defects, you get a, bad, a small child who has come like this, and, um, uh, and you saw the X-ray too. Now it's very bad. The X-ray tells us now how badly contaminated it is. Always we use a tunicate during deprivation. There's a closer picture. So at the end of deprivation, it looks like this. At the end of deprivation, it looks like this. You shorten the bit of the alarm and then fix it up. You put in an external pins. You put it now away in the away from the wound so that it, it's, the pin is in the skin. And you do an abdominal flap. And this is a small child of you know, four years old. We have done this uh, uh, abdominal flap. And there it goes. You now he heals primarily. And we have not done anything because the other side he had the nerves intact and the flexor tendons intact before any secondary procedures being done. If you'd ask me whether the success was because of the flap, I would say the success was because of the deprivation which we did now before the, before the flap. So radical deprivation doesn't mean you know you don't exercise it like a cancer section. You need to spend a lot of time. You need to skeletonize the longitudinal structures, but it takes time. Now, but it's well worth it. The next is you know when do you do these flaps, you know you can do it in a primary. You think you can just deprive and then go ahead and then do it. But then if you have a patient like this, you need to come to a stage like this. And that's the key. You need to come to a stage like this so that then after that you plan and you plan. And then if you have a very large defect, yeah, what you could do is uh, this part of it, we used a flap. And this part of it, you used a, we divide them into critical and non-critical areas. You cover the critical areas with the flap. And then you see the way the design, the flap is designed. That means it's got a good first wave. It's got that. And there is now without doing any secondary procedures because when you raise flaps, you know, we always you know you custom design the flaps. It's not that you make a box like flaps. You have to custom design the flaps so that they're good. So it gives you now after same reconstruction, it gets an extremely good flexion, good extension. So the uh, next important point when you do the abdominal flaps is that now you must you can plan once, twice, thrice, four times, but then you know you cut once. I think once you're planning, you take time, not time. You now you just uh, really plan it well, and then you know when you execute it, you now you can be really be fast in doing that. See now we go about you now how you plan. See here you get a lot for a long flap, you know, which we asked you now. See is the area. So when you see the thumb is okay, right? It's got a thinner eminence, but the rest of the head is gone. And uh, here the index is the rest of the world, but there are no fingers. Uh, we really want some, we want to place the, this ray, this digit in a position where the thumb could meet it. I think that's what you decide. So you make a first web and you really make the first web longer, you fix it up and all that. So this area needs a flap. That means, you know, you need to have a flap which comes like this and attaches and goes, goes like this. If you make a flap like going here and here, the not flap, this part of it will be exposed and this will, this will get infected. So the flap insert has to go like this and then come. I think that, that's the key. And how do you do that? Now, same antistabilitic spine. For any flap, you need to do that. Always you know, we have the lint piece and we uh, measure it. And we have a rough idea as to how it, uh, how is the defect and then transpose it to the place where the vessels are. So you place it over there. And then after that, you know, the antistability, then after that, now you can really narrow it down. I think you can narrow when you, you just the business end. Then after that, now when you know this is what is going to be inset into the hand, and after that, now you can narrow it down. You see that finally that is narrowed down like this. I think the, the, the blood is here, you put it on, the other one is here. So that's the, this goes for the finger, and that's what you do. Then it is bulky. <clears throat> then you need to reduce the, you need to thin. So it is very bulky. And if you have a, a bulky small edge like this, if you get into your finger, you just can't switch it to your finger. It's impossible to switch it. You will lift these flaps and you will find there is a small line that will be there in this way. I think there's a scapus fascia, that line. You can take off everything that is deeper to that. I think you can just take off you now one shot, now you take off everything deeper to that. That will make it very thin. 
And particularly the, the areas which is here, they are all no random pattern flaps. They can really make them in a very thin. See, initially it looks like this. So you take a lot of fat you can be taken and you are making it thin. I think you really want to make it thin. So here you find is only will be there. Dermis is a little bit of it will only be here. So that's the way you know, the flap goes. And uh, you can make it even narrow here, but then this is what the defect is. So you can make the flap like this and attach it like this. Okay, this, that's the flap, that's the flap and is attached. So you will find that the, the base is narrow. And this is what increases comfort. Okay, that's what it is. What is increases comfort is the inset, the increased inset is what you know, increases increases comfort, and the patient you know, is healed. And you will find you know, that we, as we decided, that we wanted to place it in such a way that the thumb meets the fingers, and then after that, he uh, it, it does it very well. If you get infected wounds, you, know, you get more larger defects. Okay, so it is these situations are very thing. That sometimes you know random pattern the abdominal flaps uh, they score over because you'll find when you do a free flap i think here if i think we may be getting it since we need a flap from here so if we have it somewhere here we get the artery somewhere there artery the vein the the wider part of it the wider part of the distal end you know you need to have a broader flap so most of the times when you do a free flap the, the end the end side you know usually now we tap it we make it smaller but if you're doing a, a pedicle flap, I think you know, that doesn't really matter. So you could do it. A patient came like this, came about you know, a few thousand kilometers away. He's a professional hockey player. So you debride it like this. Okay, you debride it, you take out all that uh, things. So you know what is being being lost. And now you come, you know, so there's a very big white defect is there. So this is very important. You need to place the thumb in a, with a wide web space. Suppose if we have the thumb, which is which is closer here, that means the amount of flap that you've been setting is lesser. Then after that, no matter what you do, no matter what you do, now you can get the thumb out. Okay, that means you need a lot more. Same thing, anterior spine. I mark it. What I do is, you know, mark the tubercle. You inch your way across the inguinal ligament, and the first bony prominence that you touch is anterior spine. And then there's the sartorius, two finger press is there. So what you need, you know, if you have this uh, super inferior epigastric artery, this is the external puntal artery. So you need, if you have this as the base, you can take the flap from the posterior actually from this up to that, and you, know, you can take the take the flap. So that's the big flap that you need. Okay. So you see how you're bringing it. Uh, people hesitate to do it because you know this coming down, this planning is the issue. So now after that, I have narrowed, I have narrowed it, even narrowed it. And this almost goes up to the, it causes, it causes a bit axillary line. But you see, I bring it over here, and this is what is going to get inserted into the hand. You bring it over here and then get it in so that the, you get the uh, groin flap vessel into it. That's the flap marking that has been done. There's a flap elevated and so you watch this. So that means we are getting like this so that you can get it up. And then there's a flap here, there's a groin flap, we will say perfuse this, the PS artery will perfuse this, puntal artery will perfuse this, and then you get in a full this thing. And after that, now you do a secondary extensor tendon reconstruction. Now, if FC, FCR is taken, uh, extended with the facial artery tendon grafts, and you get a reflection extension he gets. And now he was a hockey player, now he's a hockey coach. Okay, still, he's been well rehabilitated. So even larger defects we go. So here's a very major uh, injury run over. Uh, it is uh, extremely badly contaminated. So the radiograph will tell you how badly it's contaminated. You see the elbow joint is totally gone. You need to spend about two to two and a half hours deep reading. Okay. The flap comes later. Now, the flap is a simpler job. You know, the difficult job is to deep right. And if you have um, the, the hanging things like this, no matter what you do, no, this cannot get vascularized. No? So uh, approximately hours the muscles, no, you need to remove all these muscles and they need to have it. But then don't remove the tendons. You know? They can be used for later reconstruction. You know, think of certain things. You know, you can, I have done even uh, some primary tendon transfers now we are trying to do so that we use it to, uh, effectively. And now that's the defect with which you are left. The flap requirement you know, from the almost near the metacarpal heads, 
to up to that level, up to the elbow joint, you know, your knee. And you've got approximately an injury, long inch, proximal injury segment, you don't have any veins over here. So it may not be a good idea to yeah, get on to the right to the free flap is a badly injured, fractured end, is a dislocated elbow. So you need such a long flap you require. So again, the same principle is pretty easy. You mark the pubic tubercle, super size, uh, uh, spine, draw the femoral lateral, do this, two finger press, make the uh, this thing. And no matter, don't worry, don't find the vessel. This outer part of the surgery is, don't go beyond that. You know, don't go chasing the vessel. Don't keep seeing the vessel. They are always there. Just hang it, say, push the intra artery. Always there. You know, these arteries are always there. So you take it, you can take it up to the, uh, the post axillary line. So this is it, this is it. And anytime you choose, if you choose this, you can take one other territory as a random pattern. So you go this and we are crossed across the middle. So that's the random, that's the random part of it. You take it. And then see, we have put it on. See, the same markings are also still there. So I put it over there. So I have custom designed it and gone up to the elbow. We have gone up to the elbow. We have gone. And it's totally it's taken. It's up to the elbow. This flap is taken up to the elbow. And see, in spite of such a bad injury in elbow, no? and it's taken up well. And this is the circumference of the after the um, <clears throat> arm. If you deep read well, my feeling is that now you don't really get uh, um, you don't really get the lymphedema or no, distal edema. You don't get. It's only when you badly deep read you get it. So now we've seen you know how you based you now <clears throat> inferiorly based. And now you come up to superiorly based. If you have all our forearm defects, the best way is to use the <clears throat> the paramilical perforator, say area of the forearm. And here again you draw. So the same thing. This is a groin. Uh, um, uh, this is a uh, inguinal ligament area. And you, you can take it up to that. The only thing I, I keep marking is that before shaving, I always see, you know, where is the hair line is here. Never get a hair into the area. I think that's very important. I think you draw the flap, you adjust the flap such a way, you don't get the pubic hair into the into the forearm. So here, there are these are all very constant perforators. You know? So this will be the business end. And then you narrow it, narrow it down. So you take the flap. Again, you know, you can thin it. You can thin it, thin it. Now you can really thin it. And then attach it, attach it. Now, so the contour is good. The, usually the part that's attached is the mirror. And what you have done, we have delayed it and brought it back again. So that means now it has come back, now it can come back to this area. Now I come now similar sort of defect. Now I want to show you in, um, in uh, um, uh, superiorly based. This is a condition in which now um, a patient was brought to us. See, now not only you need um, uh, not only you need something on the dorsal side, you also need for the volar side. So that's the reason you know, I kept it broader. Yeah, you could keep it if I want only on the dorsal. This is all as one side, and you know, I could have made it like this. But then you know, I need this skin also. So that's the reason we kept it. So we are here, such a huge flap we have taken. So so now it's attached on one side, put a graft on the other side. So you know, after after three weeks, you delay. I think this is what you plan. This much you need. You delay this area. You you need to delay this. Otherwise, it won't work. We need to delay, and after you see there's a delay that we have done in both sides, the one third, one third you cut, and then bring it back to the other side. See, the, for this planning, you need to think as to what is the second stage you're going to do, and take that much amount of flap you need to get on the other side. I know what I'm going to do. I, I have to do a, a tendon grafts, I have to do, I have to do nerve grafts, we need to do a median nerve reconstruction, that's the ends of the median nerve, and the tendon grafts we have to do, so take the sural nerve grafts, Take a facial at uh, grafts for the tendon. So tendons are reconstructed down and the nerve grafts has been placed up. And again, now you have put it up and that's the result that you get. You know. So you could get it, uh, get it. And there's a young girl, you know, so she's able to do these activities uh, quite nicely. She can go on and on and on, she can make it better. I think you know, she only struggles a little bit when you pick up the coin, she struggles. But otherwise, you know, she could you know, she could take it up to that. She could uh, she could do that. So bulky flaps are very difficult uh, edges to suture. I think this is one of the reasons why people don't like uh, this thing. You can make the edges really thin, provided you are taking the vessels in the base. I think I have so many times I pointed. Now keep an anatomy nicely. You keep them in the base, and then you can get, get away with anything. The next thing is you find at the base the vessels are here. And as they pass through, the vessels go up. You know? So at the time when there's almost the where I have marked all the places which I have marked the large flaps, and the places you know, where which is going to get inserted into the skin, the vessels will be here. 
So you could not take off so much of skin. If you so much of fat, you, know, you should you can really take it off. And the next thing is, after taking so much of fat, I think imagine this has been so much there, you're taking it there. And the place where you're going to suture, suppose you're inserting into your finger and you just you know, bevel the fat. So here the blood supply is only subdermal. So beveling it here will not matter. So that's where. So now it is so easy to suture. It is very important to be sutured well. Skin to skin edges must be sutured well. I think that, that's very important. So the next question, the last question is when do you do secondary reconstructions in such injuries? So where you've got now yeah, total loss of uh, excess attendance? Yeah, you deliberate well. I think you know you really mark it. You, you, you have to understand you know, where are the things that have been lost. And in the operation notion, you need right now where does the distal end? Okay, that has to be written up, marked, and photographed. And here you now we've done a yeah, flap. So watch again, you know. So this much of flap I need. So we have done that and then we made it made it narrow. We get the base is narrow, so that's the way it has been inset. And that's the way that, that's the picture that you got. And after that, so when do we because we know as to what we need. So and also you would know what will be the posture reconstruction you are going to do. So from the very beginning, that area where you will pass the tendon grafts, you keep you must keep massaging. There is no time limit like you know, three months or six months or something like that. And then you, you just that the pathway must be supple and you, there must not be a lot of induration. So you take an FCU and extend the facial at a tendon graft to all these uh, tendons. And uh, that's the sort of a result that you that you get. So you could extension and then you could. Uh, so that's the part that's the uh, part that you could get. So the closing thoughts are that. You know, so again, remember this picture. I think uh, this is a picture uh, I drew. And then this is this is a picture you need to remember. Entrance bay leg spine, inguinal ligament, pubic tubercle, two finger press below the uh, this thing, and winding one uh, just along a straight line drawn to the femoral artery, a couple of centimeters away from this. If you just keep the base narrow, I think you can take harvest the whole of this flap. You don't really have to worry about the blood supply. And what you need to think is that you need to plan it well. I think you need to keep the hand and then plan it well with uh, with a cloth. Uh, pedicle flaps are generally considered to be uncomfortable to the patient, bulky, requiring more stages with no possibility of primary reconstruction. But then uh, by refining the techniques, all these presumed disadvantages, I put the word uh, presumed disadvantages, can be overcome. Uh, even if you're a good microsurgeon, no, so we do equal number of microsurgical flaps, you will still need to be a good, uh, need to do good pedicle flaps because you will need them. When free flap options are not available or uh, free flaps fail, I think uh, you will need them. And these are the, some of the these things that I repeat. I wish all of you are welcome to Gongo Hospital. And in the question and answer sessions, and I will explain a few of the things you know, which uh, we have missed out or uh, in this. Uh, so thank you so much uh, uh, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Professor Sabapathy. That's a fantastic talk um, and some fantastic examples there as well. Um, I'm going to ask if uh, we're, we're running over time a bit and I understand delegates will be wanting to get on. So we, we may just move on to the clinical cases we had prepared, if that's OK with everyone. Yeah. And um, I'll, I'll just put them, I'll share the screen now and then we can go around the panel maybe and discuss some of these cases. Um, if you just bear with me, I'll do that. So you should all be able to see the case discussions now um, and we'll simply go through them and we can um, ask different members of the panel. I'll maybe choose a few people and we'll start there if that's okay. So um, case one, this is a case being sent in from a surgeon in Nepal. Um, uh, this is a 40-year-old um, right hand uh, dominant uh, male with an R RTA and uh, dorsal right hand degloving injury with no bony or neurovascular um, injuries and the uh, apologies the questions from the surgeon are to please suggest soft tissue options and can we do spare part grafting um, from the thigh beside the flap since the paratenone is intact under it's Mr. Lamb here. You're there on the screen. Any comments from yourself? 
Um, I think if you, <clears throat> you see that distal piece of skin, if you roll it back and if it survive, hopefully the defect will be slightly smaller. Um, if I'm going to put a skin graft on this, I probably, if I have the facility to vac it for a, for a period of time until I get more granulation tissues, make sure that definitely uh, not much of the peritoneum is exposed and then uh, consider a, a split skin graft. But I actually will be quite tempted here to do something like a pedicle uh, fascial flap. And then put a split skin graft over it. I think I think if you put a skin graft directly onto tendons, although you get wound healing, sometimes you do get tendon adhesions, especially on the on the back of the hand. And when you said vacuum, you meant vacuum assisted closure. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um. Any other comments, Hank? Are you uh, are you on there? Do you, any comments regarding this? Yeah, I'm on here. I mean, I think if the if the peritoneum is all intact, the way it looks, despite the fact it's uh, multi multi planar, and um, if the peritoneum is all intact, the tendons are all intact, and the fra fra there's no fractures, then actually a graft would probably be okay. But I I would go for a full thickness skin graft rather than a split. Um, That's a massive donor site, Hank, for a full thickness skin graft. It is, but it's okay. It can come, off, it come out of the groin. You can get a 10 by 10 out of the groin. I'm just saying, you, you know, it, it's if the if the um, bed's as good as it is described, then a graft will probably work pretty well, actually. Mm. Um, better than we think. And the and of course, it depends on the circumstances. But it, I, I think you wouldn't lose very much by doing that. Um, and if the peritoneum's all intact and, and it works, then it will be probably a good outcome with nice thin skin and mobile fingers. Um, I wouldn't vac it because I actually I wanted to get it healed with a reduced inflammatory phase as quickly as possible, but but needs a good debridement. Neil, you're muted, Neil. Just uh, taking myself off that. There we go. I'll move on to case two. Um, this is a case from uh, Bangladesh, and this is a 40-year-old uh, male born from a tree presenting late. And uh, the injuries, as you can see there, with unstable wrist and soft tissue loss. Um, Dr. Atakilte um, from Addis, um, any comments with this, or what would be your thoughts with... Um, this um, management of this patient? Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure he's there, Neil. Okay. Um, any other comments from anyone? Yeah, yeah I would take it on. Um, so it is um, the bone that is protruding, you know, it's uh, totally white and dead and bone. You know, so you just take it off. And you need to debride it adequately again. To do a, do a thorough debridement. Put an external fixator on this side, and then give give him a good flap. And because we need to do some uh, work on it. And as I showed you some examples, that in the his tendons will be okay over here. And uh, by by the photographs, I think the ulnar side is the wrist FCR FCU will be available. So at a stage about a few months later. Uh, we can uh, trans use them for the extensors. And if the wrist is unstable, uh, later on uh, fuse it. Or it might not be unstable in the sense uh, that if the radius is okay, then it, it should be fine. We will need an x ray for that. But otherwise, you know, most important is that you know, don't keep this bone. That's the most important. Okay, um, I've got some further uh, photographs from the, the same patient here showing uh, debridement and I, I can't tell what's happened with the bone, but there is some stabilization wires here and um, it looks like a grafting of the proximal uh, portion here and an abdominal flap. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Professor, the, and this is a long-term outcome from this patient. Um, any comments at all from the panel? Yeah, right. yeah actually, see, this type of problems happen. And I always feel when you give a flap, you should give a very good flap. So you cannot have a flap under graft because if you like to do an extensive tendon reconstruction, 
So it is these small areas of graft which uh, hinder your passage passage of the uh, graft. You know? So I would really like to give uh, big flaps. I think that's a good thing. You know, uh, we asked to we speak about big flaps. You know? So you can do. I would prefer to be a nice. This area also must have been covered by flap. Mm -hmm. well, uh, Raja, there were there were several questions uh, about uh, the donor site. Yeah, how, yeah, yeah. How do you manage the donor site? How do you reduce scarring in the donor site? Yeah, the, the donor site. There are always two things. You, know, you can pull it up and switch. I always tell my residents, you know, whether you want a scar that is stretching or a graft that contracts. You know? Okay, so either way you could do it. Yeah, you try to close it as much as possible. The bulkier people, you can close it much much more, uh, much more. And then we put on a graft, and we need to aim at 100% take of the graft. I think that's very important. You need to take 100% weight. And suppose when you divide, you divide the flap at three weeks. If there are areas which are not taken grafts, you know, I graft them again. So if you leave them ungrafted, allow them to heal by secondary intention, then they then it's very bad. Okay, that's the that, that's the problem. You know? So. Maybe the next time I'll be putting a lot of uh, donor sites also, long term donor sites also I'll put. Okay. Uh, to, get good, to, to get good donor sites, you must make them heal primarily, even if you put a graft. That's the key. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'll move on. Um, the next case, case three, uh, is also a case from Bangladesh. It's a 26-year-old female with a flame burn and with full thickness exposure of the bone at the elbow. Um, uh, Fortune, are you there on the line? Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, just, well, the fact that the bone is exposed, definitely I'll be going for the, uh, the large uh, abdominal flaps as Professor Narajas Babati presented. That's what I use for this. But obviously, that'll be after thorough debridement. I, I, I will present along the principles it has presented. Yeah, that's uh, along those principles I'll treat this. Mm. Would you yeah. would you treat the whole defect with an abdominal flap or just the exposed bone? Uh, just yeah, that's a good point because yeah, the tendons are not affected. Now you're not thinking of doing any secondary revision surgery, but in terms of making it look better, I think a big abdominal flap will make everything look better. Once. I think uh, Dr. Atakilte managed to join back. Okay, uh, Dr. Atakilte, um, any, any comments to this case three? This is um, a female patient with a flame burn um, and uh, full thickness exposure of the electron. Thank you so much. Uh, probably I missed some of the presentation of the first and second case. For the second case, I would go for uh, uh, a large abdominal flap covering the whole diff. For this second bit, still out for the uh, cylinder, otherwise, there is uh, injury to the tail. And I want to back, do uh, uh, a deep graft with uh, approximate abdominal flap to cover the exposed bone. Great, thank you. Um, the uh... Hello, Carl. Can I comment on one thing? Uh, what is the uh... The possibility of um, that uh, latimus dorsi myocutaneous either muscle or uh, myocutaneous flap, especially for a joint that is nearby, is easy. Um, that and uh, the only thing is that that definitely it is two stages, but still um, that we can. Uh, I personally prefer for this patient time um, that uh, definitely the latimus dorsi flap, myocutaneous flap. Myocutaneous. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll advance the slides to show what was done. Um, the looks like the majority of the area was grafted um, with um, an abdominal flap for the exposed bony area. Um, uh, any further comments from the panel? Yeah, in the sense, you know, this uh, you said is epilepsy and a flame burn. You know? So the bone will be okay. So what it really requires, you need to shave off the cortex. It's not it's unlike a fracture, it's not unlike a road traffic accident. So you need to shave off the cortex and then uh, yeah, provide an abdominal flap. I think there are very tricky ways, nice ways of doing it. Uh, I would do it in a different way. So what you do is now you place the patient on the lateral side. I think it's a trick. You, you have to, whenever you want to cover the elbow, whether the front or the back with the pedicle flap, you place the patient on the lateral side and then keep the hand, uh, keep the elbow. 
And then if it is on the posterior side, you know, the flap is based on the posterior side. You just raise the flap. Don't bother where the blood is. So you raise it and then slap it. It'll be fine. So if it is in the front, you know, you take it from the front side and then put it on. If it's on the back side, you put it. And you will find that the patients are extraordinarily comfortable. Extremely comfortable. I think in, in three, four days, you know, they'll walk. Yeah, this is you know, a little difficult for him to make them walk in this position, this flap, in, the, in this position for elbow. And when they sit or stand, it will come down. It may be a bit difficult, not that impossible. But that's why you know, it's very, 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 very yeah, comfortable. Yeah, elbow cover with pedicle flap. Trunk flaps, we call them. Great. Thank you very much. Um... I'm going to move on to case four. I think this is a case from the Alert Center in uh, Ethiopia, um, a high voltage electrical burn injury, um, which presented three weeks after the accident. Um, uh, maybe comments from Henk? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's um, looks like that's a, either entry or exit point straight through the median nerve, probably, sadly. <laughs> Um, but I, that's perfect for a PIA flap for me. <laughs> uh, so I'd do that and then reconstruct or, or um, graft a muscle, a nerve tendon injury as appropriate. Okay, great. I've got some, uh, uh, these were the uh, questions, but um, I'll maybe uh, bring on to the reconstructive method and ask um, Abraham to comment. Um, uh, well, is your case is Abraham. Yes, yes, it's my case. I'm that. Still, the issue is that because it's a high voltage electrical current injury, and uh, well, the the external appearance and the, the the internal destruction might not be corresponding one one. The other thing is that because it is a current injury nearby, I was in fact entertaining um, that some pedicle flaps from the nearby, and one of the 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 the, the thing that I was I entertain on this patient is uh, a, perforate, a perforator from the uh, ulnar artery. But uh, the, the challenge is that because the, the injury site is nearby, in fact, I did, after a good uh, development, um, that I did a sort of exploratory type of incision so that to see whether that uh, flap, that the, the perforator for Becker's flap is there. So this is a kit. So rather than uh, doing other flap, I, I, I prefer to do the, the, the Baker flaps. So I covered the, the initial and the proximal part is intact. So I just put a skin craft on the donor side. So that's, that's what, what I, definitely the posterior interventions artery flap is also, is also an, an issue. But for me, I, I prefer that the Baker flap for, because it's nearby and uh, easy. Great, thank you. Um, I'll move on to our last case. Um, this is uh, a, not a trauma. This is a, a tumor excision case. Um, as you can see there, uh, first web space um, and a cross index and uh, thumb metacarpals with loss of dorsal metacarpal cortex and EPL. Um, and I'll maybe Put that out to all the panel. Any comments on reconstructive options uh, here? Non microvascular. Yeah, yeah um, I think because it's a tumor, so it's a non microvascular tumor, I think I'll go for a red light forum flap. Yeah, I think that that would be a straightforward, simple. You can really keep the thumb open, okay, and then keep it. Uh, and this is a defect little, little, uh, we can do. I think if we can do a post introduction flap also, but I really like uh, have a radial lateral forearm flap in the, the bulk will add on to the, yeah, the post introduction flap is a thinner flap, you know. So uh, for this case where the first web space, there's uh, some gaps and all that is there, is that extra fat makes it nicer. So that would be my first choice. Great. Um, Henk, you had mentioned before with larger flaps, you don't like to graft the donor. Would you consider a PIA over a radial forearm here? So the I, because it's a tumor case, there's an additional yes. consideration, yes. which yes. is uh, whether or not they need radiotherapy post-op uh, or whether they're having it pre-op. And the reason being is because if you use a, a local or a local regional pedicle flap, 
then certainly our radiotherapists want to ir irradiate the whole field, which is so it won't include just the whole operative field. So it won't include just the sarcoma excision field, but also the uh, pedicle flap field. So, so that would influence our choice. So if you, let's say this was on more dorsally rather than dorsal radial, then I would try to keep my flap also dorsal so that they irradiate just the dorsum and not dorsum and palmar. If you have a dorsal defect and then a palmar based radial forearm flap, then they have to irradiate both the palmar side and the dorsal side, oh. which doesn't leave a, a lymphedema vascular corridor, if you like. And so you're much more likely to get uh, radiotherapy complications. So, so for me, if they're going to have post-op radiotherapy, that'd be a real indication to do a <laughs> free flap. <laughs> but if you can't, then, then, a, then a, uh, a, a more distant flap, like a groin flap, would be good because they'd be healed, they'd be detached, and they could have their post-op radiotherapy six weeks later, and yet you haven't done any other injury to the um, arm or forearm. If they're having new adjuvant radiotherapy and so they're having radiotherapy before the excision, then that's not so much for consideration. Then you can use whatever flap you like, frankly. Um, but I'd keep in mind that the, the likelihood of recurrence and further therapy, um, but then yeah, you could use a PIA or a radial forearm or whatever. Now the distal radius, the radial artery will be gone here. So a distally based radial forearm flap may not work unless they kept the palmar, um, uh, you know, the thena branch. But anyway, that's something else to think about when <laughs> thinking about it, uh, about your source of pedicle flaps. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the decision here was a PIA and um, probably um, designed too radially, I think. But, uh, um, and uh, obviously with the larger donor site leaving a bit of a... Um, uh, an, an ugly scar in the dorsum, but uh, giving a good uh, thin reconstruction there. But that's interesting, your points regarding radiotherapy fields. Um, I think that's possibly our last case, um, and we have run over time. Apologies. That's just, a, a, again, our learning outcomes. And um, I just want to... I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll stop sharing and ask Amy if she could... Um, put up the uh, poster for the for the second part of this webinar. Um, and I'd also, I'd, also, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all of our panelists and our speakers today. Um, thank you for giving up your time on a Saturday afternoon. Um, I find this uh, immensely useful, all of the talks, and I've learned a lot of new stuff. So thank you for that. Um, uh, Neil, just to mention, part two is going to focus on microsurgery. And maybe Fortune can say something about it quickly, Fortune, because you are sharing this. Yes, uh, it's going to be on this, the 18th of September by 2 p.m. UK time. And uh, we hope to, it's a continuum of what we have uh, discussed today. We already talked about the principles. So we're going to talk about the microsurgical options and also setting up a microsurgery um, system in your wherever you work especially it's very established where we do work here but in other places the challenges that they do have we do have experts who'll be talking about uh, these things uh do be a great one to look out for okay the the the, the uh, link to register will be in the feedback that will be sent to you please fill in the feedback and also you'll be on the bssh and b first websites thanks very much for thanks. organizing everything Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend. Thank you, Thank you Neil. Thank you, Uji. Thank you. Yeru, Thank Professor you. Raja, Ibrahim. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Great work. Thank you. 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 Thank you.